give everyone about a minute finalize some of our commissioners coming on right away and then we'll get started. Is someone going to turn up turn on our photos our video or do we do that? Um, you have the power to turn on your own video. Okay. Um, let's see. Where do I do that? Oh, start video. Okay. There you are, Maria. Thank you. Sure. It looks like we at least have quorum, so let's get started. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our, um, <clears throat> excuse me, our San Jose Charter Commission meeting of March 8th, 2021. Um, welcome on this special night of International Women's Day, um, and I'd like to ask the clerk to take the roll to establish quorum. Barbara? Barbara Marshman? Christina Johnson? Here. Dan Bazzuto. Dan Bazzuto. Oh, Elizabeth, did you say? Here. <laughs> Not yet. Uh, uh, you're next, Elizabeth Bonley. Oh, yeah. okay. Ellie Matsumura. Here. Thank you. Enrico Callender. Good evening. Frank Maitsky. Frank Majitsky. Okay, I'm going to come back to those people who I marked absent because I see that Dan's entered. Um, so I'll come back to everybody who's absent at the end in case people sign on. Garrick Percival. Uh, here. George Sanchez. Present. Lee Tran. Here. Jeremy Bruce. Present. Jose Posadas. Present. Lundy up. Linda Lazat. Linda. Here. Here. Louis. Um. Luis Barocio. Present. Magnolia Siegel. Magnolia. Maria Fuentes. Here. Sammy Robledo. Here. Mary Segura. Present. Lee Tran. Lee Tran. Present. Veronica Amador. Present. Yong Zhao. Here. Frederick Ferrer. Here. Dan Bazzuto. Here. Barbara Marshman. Here. Frank Majitsky. Lundiep. And Magnolia Siegel. You have a quorum. Thank you. Let us begin then. Um, tonight, I'm going to move us through our agenda as expediently as I can because we do have guests coming tonight and they're on time certain. So if we can move through this first part of the agenda, um, I'll try to keep us moving. So good evening and welcome. Tonight, we have the first item is our consent calendar. Can I get a motion to approve the consent? Move approval. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Lazat. And a second? Second. Um, that's a motion and a second. So the clerk can take the roll. Barbara? Yes. Christina? Yes. Dan? Dan? Dan, you're on mute. Dan? Dan, I need you to say yes or no. 
Can you hear me? Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, I'm going to yes. come back. I'll come back to him at the end. Elizabeth? Yes. Ellie? Yes. Enrico? Yes. Frank? Oh, wait, Frank is still absent? Correct. I'll call the absent people for the first couple of votes just in case they popped on without me seeing them. Um, Garrick? Hi. George? Uh, my first meeting, so I guess uh, I, I don't have a vote right now, right? You you can vote, but you can also recuse. Okay, yeah, I'll vote yes then. Okay. Um, Kui Tran? Yes. Same option for you. Jeremy? Jeremy Bruce? Aye. You're the only Jeremy this time, this from now on, by the way. Um, Jose? Yes. Um, Lun? He just texted me to say he was running late. Um, I wasn't sure if, he's, if he got here. Linda? Yes. Um, Luis? Yes. Magnolia? Maria? I have to abstain since I wasn't here on February 8th for those minutes. So. Um, you can vote yes, but you can recuse. So I'll mark you down as abstain. Sammy? Yes. Harry? Yes. Me? Yes. Veronica? Yes. Young? Yes. Oh, Dan? Yes. Thank you. Now you can move on. Thank you so much. That, that uh, motion carries. And now I'm going to go to reports. Uh, the, the first report is mine, which is just uh, a thank you for submitting your responses to the questionnaire. Um, it was really helpful to, for just from an organizational perspective, to get all the data that we got, and you'll see some of it reflected in tonight's work plan, but it also helps us in our planning for our public hearings. 17 uh, folks submitted their questionnaire responses with lots of comments, uh, great, you know, thoughtful comments. I really appreciated um, Lawrence and I went through all of them, and you'll see a lot of them reflected in the work that we've put together tonight in the work plan. Uh, and you'll see more of it as we move forward in our civic engagement process. So thank you so much for doing that. There was a couple of questions that came up around, you know, what, what are we doing civic engagement? I thought we weren't, we're going to do. So we'll talk about that as we get to the work plan tonight. But it really helped us to get everything down on paper during this time of the month that we had in between our meetings. So thank you for everyone for participating in that. That was really helpful. Um, I'm now going to turn over to um, to Tony to um, welcome our new two commissioners and also uh, and then we'll move into our uh, our next business. Tony? Um, yeah, the only excuse me, Mr. Chair. Excuse me. Uh, sorry, excuse me, Mr. Chair. I, I, um, we may have needed to do this under orders of the day, but I had a question about the order of the agenda and was wondering when you might be able to entertain that. Um, let's go to the next, let, let's finish this one item and then I'll come back. Thank you. Real quick announcement, you, we've had two um, resignations from the commission. And so we have two new commissioners, Hui Tran for District 4 and George Sanchez from District 7, and they are both in attendance today. So welcome to both of you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate that. Um, Commissioner Matsumura, your item, your question? Yes, thank you. Um, I was uh, looking at the agenda and thinking that for purposes of our action on our work plan, um, it could be valuable actually to be able to take into account anything we learn from the historical presentations uh, that might inform the way that we want to shape the approach to our work. And so I know you mentioned that we have a time certain on those. I'm wondering if there's any flexibility to actually take the new business before the old business so that we can benefit from the learning that way. Um, you, uh, I don't think we need to because we can take um, action. We did put into the agenda that we can take possible action after the discussion with the, our guests and our first learning session. And so um, one of the adjustments that I've made to the, to the agendas is that I've 
put things in for motions to, to take action. So we don't have to worry about, oh, we've got to do it now. So we definitely can. Um, and as we take up the work plan, which is next, um, I'll talk a little bit about kind of our ongoing process for adjustments as we move forward. So I don't think we need to um, to reverse the order tonight. Um, so let's move to the old business. And the, just a quick comment, and I also see a, a, a hand raised from uh, Commissioner right. Callender. Um, we also, uh, inviting folks, uh, we have to choose a time for them to come. So we've asked our, our guest speakers to log on at 645. So that would be the earliest that we could actually, assuming that they actually join at 645, that would be the earliest we can move that agenda item up to. So um, yeah, apologies about that limited flexibility. Uh, and I think it's 715, Lawrence. Uh, I think right. I, I, we have it on the agenda for 715. There's the, we never know exactly when we're going to get there. I asked them to join at 645. Right. It's 615, so, we so we will not be able to have them on any, any, any sooner than 645. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, Commissioner Callender. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I was going to say, I actually agree with Commissioner Matsumura. I'm not really sure what she said. So do we intend to, we'll hear the business and then we'll postpone our action after we hear the new business and then come back for action on the work plan? Did I understand that correctly or am I not following? Um, no, I think what I'm saying is that we would take action on the work plan. And if there's additional items that you want to add to the work plan or to give direction um, after the new business, you, we can take a motion at that time. So the work plan is gonna be an ongoing living document. So I, I assume we're gonna change it almost every commission meeting as we add to uh, giving staff direction around what do we need to do next? Or now that we know that we're gonna change it and do this. So um, I think we can ongoingly be adjusting the work plan as we, as we move forward, right? We, we're not trying to get a document that's set in stone forever. We really need it to be able to have that flexibility. So tonight we'll take up the work plan to wanna to make sure you understand the changes that have been edited from the suggestions that you all made. Um, can we get it? Um, and, and is there a direction that you wanna give on this? So the motion tonight is to accept and then other possible directions you may suggest. Then we'll have the new item with the new business, which is to the study session around the 1985 commission which again came from your request. And then if again, if there's direction at that point, um, we will entertain motions then um, after our public, uh, public comment. So okay. we have the ability to make adjustments along the way and I'll continue that process throughout so that we never feel like, well, we said we had to do this and so now we can't change it. We'll always be kind of ongoingly adjusting the work plan. Okay. Other items before, any other? Comments, I see no other hands. Okay, so let's take up um, the old business, which is the revisiting the work plan. Um, tonight, what we'd like to do is uh, we're gonna hear from Tony that's gonna be giving you responses to the questions you had on the two areas um, <clears throat> that, you, that came up from our earlier questions around um, the, the scope of the budget and the, the civic engagement promotion uh, from the city. Um, then we're going to actually, I'm asking Lawrence to walk through the revisions that were made in the work plan itself so everyone can kind of just see where the adjustments are. Then we'll open it up for discussion and then um, pos the public comments, and then we'll come back for possible action. So I'd like to get a vote to adopt the work plan as it is tonight with the adjustments that you want to make if there's further recommendations, um, but I kind of want to move us from talking about the work plan to get the work plan in place enough that we can start moving forward. And as I say, we can adjust it as we go, but let's kind of go in that way. All right, so let's start with um, a presentation from Tony that's gonna start answering some of the questions that commission raised around this, the budget for this commission and our promotional um, actions and activities as they are to date. Tony? Hello, I'm, I'm trying to find it. I have so many open windows. Uh, so hold on just a second. It's not really a presentation. Um, I'm just going to talk about the memo that I submitted to you guys. So um, we, we definitely, a, a goal of the city clerk's office is to increase public access to city government. Um, to that end, I was able to get approval for 
um, using a consultant to help facilitate these meetings because it's, you guys have a lot to do in a very short time to do it. So um, I felt it was it was money well spent to have a consultant come in to really help focus everybody um, to stay on track to get the work done. Um, but no additional money, especially due to the COVID budget cuts, um, was provided to us for um, translation interpretive services. The council general is budgeted um, for about sixty-four thousand dollars a year for to provide translations and interpretation for council meetings. So it's not a lot. So if you looked at my my um, my memo, I have it's one hundred ninety dollars per hour for Spanish interpretation and two hundred eighty for Vietnamese interpretation of meetings. Um, our current council policy is to provide interpretation upon request. Um, the goal of this meeting. What, or for Charter Review Commission is for you guys to get the background to learn about the different forms of government. And then when you um, when you kind of have a proposal that you're you're ready to kind of put out there to bring in public hearings um, and to get public comment and do interpretation for those kind of meetings. Um, so th there's something for them to see and hear from you. And that's kind of what we do with the city council offices. Um, for translation of documents, um, the lowest cost I estimate I got for translating council agendas was 15 cents per word. Um, and we can't auto translate with software to bring the cost down. There's too many technical terms in government um, to trust that uh, auto software would interpret things correctly. Um, I was working in a city once where uh, auto translator had put a council candidate as being a member of a cult instead of a member of a church. So it's things like those little nuances. That's that's a big difference, the cult versus church. So we cannot use auto translating to bring that cost down. Auto translating um, cuts the cost down by about a third. So it, it's a huge savings, but it doesn't work well for us. Um, our current outreach is that it's posted on the Insight page with all the other agendas. I send the agenda link to all of the city council, um, not just city council members, but all city council staff. So anybody who has contact with, with the city, you know, the, the council staff is really out there. Um, we also post link to the agenda on Twitter. And then it's also promoted through the city's YouTube page. Um, and then you guys had asked for what are all the other outreaches that we have access to at the city. So I did include a link to the um, all the social media and internet accounts with the city. Um, one thing that's changed since our last meeting was I have had a city clerk YouTube channel where I could post things. Um, I have how to read an agenda, how to um, participate in a meeting. I have a couple, uh, I just recorded a, how to um, how to apply to boards and commissions. So that, that'll be posted this week. Um, but that's been moved from our city clerk page to the city, the city's page, the main city page, which is really exciting because it'll, it'll have more outreach. So I'll be doing more of those videos um, that will be reaching out to a wider swath of the community. At first, they're going to be English. I'm not scripting them. It's just me talking. Um, as I develop scripts for them, I can have bilingual staff film their own versions. So currently, they're English-only videos that with the plan to um, script them out and have them um, at least in Spanish and Vietnamese. But in the city clerk world, we also look at um, Chinese and Tagalog because those are our election languages mandated by the state of California to translate election stuff into. So the second page of my memo is just a postcard graphic. I didn't, I was gonna go ahead and have it translated, but I wanted you guys to see it first. Um, maybe um, you guys have, have something else I should put in there. Um, to make it more exciting, or you think maybe the wording is, is just too dry, um, or whatever or feedback you want to give me on my little postcard. Um, and then I was going to have that interpreted or translated, and try to get the two words correct, translated into um, Spanish, Tagalog, Chinese, and Vietnamese, because those are um, the four languages we translate into for election material. And that that's really all I have. And Tony, can you talk about the scope of work in terms of the first one, the cost and estimates, the scope yes. of work that we have with um, civic makers? 
Um, so Civic Makers is your meeting facilitator. They're not, um, they don't work for me. They work for, well, they work kind of work for me, but um, they're not my, my staff. So they're not here to facilitate postings to the internet. Um, they're not managing the website. They're not doing the social media. Um, that's all city employees. What Lawrence and his team are here to um, keep the discussions organized. There's, you know, 23 people. There's a lot to accomplish in a short amount of time. So um, what he's doing is helping you get the information you need to make the decisions you make um, and to keep the meetings on track because it's very easy, um, especially in a large group of people, to kind of go down a rabbit hole towards something that really <laughs> part of what you're supposed to be looking at. So if you're supposed to be looking at uh, what form of government, and then you kind of, like, I'm the queen of falling down the rabbit hole when I'm doing research. It's like, oh, this little thread looks really interesting. I'm going to go over there. Um, Lawrence is, is to keep us from doing that and to keep us on the job that the council has asked you to do. Thank you, Tony. And I see two hands. Um, Commissioner Tran. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Tony, quick question. The, term, the quotes that you got for translators, is that because the city has to rely, like it has to meet specific certifications or requirements to be able to bring on translators? For interpreters in meetings, yeah, we, we use, well, we use professional interpreters. We don't use city staff. Um, city staff is good for like counter work or going out yeah. and talking to people. But whenever we have a council meeting or any sort of public outreach meeting, we always use professionals. Um, and we try to use the same professionals that work with governments because there are a lot of our terms that when an interpreter first comes to us, they're like, I don't even know what you're talking about. So a lot of times they're reading the material ahead of the meeting so they could kind of figure out what type of stuff they're going to be interpreting. So it, it, gets, it gets really complicated, um, especially when you're looking at like housing and planning issues that are environmental things. It could just get really confusing. So we do definitely use um professionals they're not necessarily court certified um but they're professional interpreters who um are neutral parties too because what we don't want is somebody with sort of an agenda to do your your interpreting because you want to know that it's not somebody from the planning department who's trying to push people to go a certain way you want it to be neutral and and ac as accurate as possible Thank you. Outside of the, uh, I'm sorry, if I, if I may, I have a follow up. Mm -hmm. Outside of the meeting context, um, do you rely, do you have the same standards for people who do translation of materials or outreach? Um, I don't know what you mean by outside of the meeting. Because meeting for, uh, what I do is in meetings. Oh, okay. I, I guess I, this might be your topic for later, but I'm also referring to any outreach efforts that we conduct. I would use professional translators, yes, because a lot of a lot of people who may be bilingual for work purposes may not be as fluent in translating documents as you would want them to be, um, because like somebody might be able to talk to somebody at the counter and help them, but not necessarily um, be able to translate something for them. So I, I use professional translation for, I might do like a quick email if it's one or two sentences to a customer with, with a staff person, but any documents, I, I always go with professional to make sure that it's accurate. Uh, Commissioner Callender. Yes, thank you. I got a couple of questions. I know the last time we talked about that translation, we'd also talked about outreach and I don't see any kind of outside of the volunteers here taking on the outreach, I didn't see any kind of budget included for outreach. I'm trying to put together in my head a, a request that we can make of council. Obviously, you're saying this wasn't budgeted, so I'm hoping to make a holistic type request of council as we've talked about before. So, it, so I'm hoping that maybe we can next meeting bring something back that would not only look at this, but also I know we're gonna be talking about historical um, historical, what, what had happened historically. And my, my understanding is that it may have been outside council historically that was assigned to the uh, signed to the commission. So if that's the case, I'd even probably want to make a request for that, as well as an outreach, as well as a research for budget. Now this goes back to, um, to the clerk. One of the things that you mentioned, the scope of services for civic makers, was research included in that? Or who do we have to do the research 
to provide recommendations or even provide information back? Or do we have anyone? Um, well, Lawrence has done some research because he put together the city charter 101. Yeah. Uh, Megan did the, has done a lot of the historical document research that's been posted on our website. Mm -hmm. She's done the research onto the other cities. So the, I think it's 20 cities that have their charters. Megan did all of that. So okay. um, our, our, any research would be done by my staff or interns. I have, we have one intern um, who's a, who is working with you guys. So would it be helpful if in this request, if we were to ask for additional dollars for research, or do you believe we have it handled? I think we could have research handled. I actually enjoy research. That's like the, my favorite thing to do in the world. I spend my whole weekend researching things um, for my daughter or helping her research. Um, I, I think with, with Megan and Corinna and I, we've got research covered. So, so through the chair. If I could, uh, Commissioner Callender, could I just provide a little more context on our scope? Um, our scope is basically three buckets. One is um, essentially um, discovery and planning. The, the planning piece is ongoing, managing the work plan. Um, and I, I include in that uh, scheduling guest speakers, that kind of outreach as it comes up. The biggest bucket is meeting facilitation. And that breaks out into to working with the chair to design the meeting agenda, facilitating these meetings and taking notes, and then preparing meeting minutes and summaries. Um, we have budgeted uh, up to 60 potential meetings um, because we're unsure about how uh, the, the scope of this is going to go. Um, and so that number that you saw is an NTE, you know, this is a not to exceed uh, contract for, for time and materials. The last bucket is a, a smaller bucket for analysis, summaries, and reporting. There's a little bit of, of scope for research um, and analysis. The majority of it is, is, uh, is bucketed towards um, majority and minority reports at the end of, uh, of, of this process to support you all in developing those reports as necessary. So I just wanted to, to give you a bit more uh, detail about, about what we are contracted to do. Uh, so there is some flexibility, but also just to make sure that we fulfill the, the scope of our contract, we do need to be mindful about where we spend our time given the current scope to make sure that we help the commission meet its obligations that we've been contracted to support. So, so, so Mr. Chairman, I, I think where I'm trying to head is I think we don't have a full picture of basically the costs I think that will be borne by this, including the outreach costs are pretty much not here. Could I, could I ask you for our next meeting to maybe have staff assimilate or pull together an item that would potentially have all the costs so we can make a, a full recommend or a full request from council for the costs that would include better outreach um, translation services um, if, the, if the staff believes that we would need additional staff for research capabilities, I think that, you know, I, I look to you, Tony, for that, but also potentially outside counsel. So, and I have no idea if indeed we did, if they did have outside counsel, I know we'll be hearing about that later on, but if that's indeed what was uh, the support that was provided to prior commissions, I would ask for the same. So thank you, Commissioner Callender, and I will, as we get to the place of the, the next piece of this, which is the adoption of the work plan, that can easily be added to as a, again, that's the direction you want us to move. If the commission supports that, we will continue to do that. I'm gonna move us to um, Commissioner Marshman and then Commissioner Fuentes. Thank you, uh, quick question. Um, and maybe this isn't the place for it, but uh, talking about research, there are some specific ideas that people have brought up to me, my dentist, for instance, mm -hmm. of things that we should be looking into. Um, and uh, one of them is the relative, the cost of doing a, moving to a stronger mayor, maybe not super strong mayor, uh, but what what is the cost differential? And his theory was that it, it is a lot more expensive because of turnover every four, eight years and that sort of thing. Uh, and there are other ideas I have that I would like to be included in research. What's the format for that? Can I send somebody an email and ask about it? I could do some of that myself, but I don't know how much you want members generating research. I'm going to hold that question, um, Councilmember Marshall, and I think that's a good question that we all need to have a conversation about, but give me a little bit of time to do it. When we get to the outreach piece, I want to hear from the commission around what roles you want to play. Uh, Commissioner Fuentes. 
Thank you. Um, so uh, thank you, Tony, for the presentation and this information. I just wanted, I had three comments, um, particularly related to the language issue. So first of all, I am, um, I'm happy to hear that the, the city um, focuses on the same languages that we use for the ballots. So I think if we work and think in that terms, like Spanish, Vietnamese, Tagalog, and Chinese, it narrows it to something that's possible and, ma and manageable. And then also, um, I, I like the idea because it's just, you know, maybe the, the only unrealistic, the only realistic thing we can do is to wait until we actually have an idea or a plan that we kind of um, determine is, is the beginning of our recommendation before we go out into the community. Because I think, you know, we have to let them know what we're doing, um, what this is for, and then to be able to actually talk about something concrete will, will really make it me um, meaningful for them to, to give us input. And then the other thing I wanted to suggest is today when we have our speakers, maybe that's something we're, we're already doing, but we should ask each of them when, um, when they were doing the charter review, how they handled outreach and you know what they did in the community. Because at minimum, I hope that we will, you know, as Rick is saying, submit a proposal to the city council. But at minimum, um, I hope that we do as much as was done in the past, because if in the past they had good results, then we should be thinking, well, we want to do similarly so that we can also have good results to engage the community and, and do the best job possible in terms of our recommendations. Um, Commissioner Barrosio. Perfect, thank you. Uh, could you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so good evening, everyone. Uh, in terms of Tony's postcard, so first, uh, thank you, Tony, for, for putting this together. Um, we really appreciate it. Uh, in reading it, um, in the first sentence, I wonder if a word uh, choice could be looked at. So the Charter Review Commission is examining the city's governance structure um, and soliciting uh, community input on strong mayor systems. So instead of strong, I wonder if it can just say um, soliciting community input on different mayor systems or various mayor yeah. systems. Um, it's, just, it's just a suggestion. And okay. yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, and the second sentence of the goal of their work, and it ends um, before the colon, not limited to. I wonder if it's just me, right? Um, but I wonder if that can be two sentences. I don't know if if breaking that up, it is it is a little wordy, um, especially <laughs> if it's followed by by a list. So I wonder if that can just be cut down because again, like this is just going to be a very small snapshot. I don't want to lose people in the second sentence because um, what we do is, is, is at the end. And then um, in terms of please visit us at, and the websites there, if there's a possibility that that could be shortened, um, obviously a postcard, I imagine it's gonna be mailed, it's gonna be put up on bulletin boards to type that out with all the dashes and backslashes, that is a lot of characters. So I don't know- yeah, I, I, I can ask, you're breaking up. Yeah, you're breaking up the, I can talk with our web um, designer for making a short URL, because um, he's done that for me for the elections. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, just, just in that case. And then also, Chair, is this the right time to talk about the work plan or right now are we talking yeah, about- yeah, We're almost there, we're almost there. This is oh, just okay. questions for Tony about her, her memo and we're gonna get to the work plan next. Okay, perfect, thank you, that's it. If anybody else has comments specifically on the editing of the postcard, I'd ask that you just send those directly to Tony um, and that way we can keep moving forward. Commissioner Matsumura. Thank you. So, um, so, you know, I think that in order to succeed in the responsibilities that we've been given, uh, entrusted with as a commission, we've got to have three components, right? We've got to have the public engagement, both information from the public, as well as bringing them along with our learning so that they're in a good position to give feedback. We've got to have the policy research and analysis, and then we have to have 
the ability of the commission to, to construct some pretty complex policy approaches potentially to the information that we take in. And so in looking at where we started with resources and really appreciate um, Tony that you saw that we were gonna have that need for consultant support and, and that we have that support um, from Lawrence on that front. I, I do think that we have needs for other resources if we're gonna be really successful in our approach, right? So, so we, I think for, for public engagement, there's a number of pieces that we've talked about, but I guess we'll be talking about the order of the work plan soon. I think, I do think that public engagement is needed sooner than what's currently contemplated, but we'll get to that. I do think that we need other resources, right? Like we have community organizations that day in, day out are talking to the members of our community about the issues that affect their lives. And that's what they do. And that's what they're expert at. And so, and they are much better than I am at, you know, saying what's the way to do that? Is it a postcard? You know, what times of day or should the meetings be, et cetera. So we need the resources to tap into that expertise of the community who, by the way, are doing that in language, right? Even without interpreters, because they're just working with communities in language. We need substantive research support. I think, you know, Barbara, Commissioner Marshman gave an excellent example of that. And that, and that also, I think we're going to need the outside counsel so that if we need to take some very creative approaches, so say we want to make these changes to the powers of the mayor, and we're going to complement that by changing up the way that these city, city manager powers look and these city council powers look. I'm making that up, obviously. But that is, um, that I think is the kind of creativity that we are called upon to undertake and that that's going to require not only, and by the way, thank you so much to the city clerk's office for doing that work that I think is just above and beyond what we expect day in, day out from the city clerk's office to compile those city charters. But we also need the research capacity who can look at the charters and give us some comparative analysis of what do we see there? And, and then also research the data of how do we how do we understand what we see? You know, what are the cost impacts like Commissioner Marshman was talking about? How do we understand the indicators of what's working better or worse in different cities? And that's some that's some pretty sophisticated technical research that we need folks with the, the training in the background to feed to us as a commission and to the public so that we're all coming along with a deep understanding and then working with outside counsel to to come up with quality language that works for, for us as a city of San Jose. Thank you. I want to move us to the work plan because I think that these, this is a conversation that we're going to have in a second as well. So I'm going to ask Lawrence to walk through the, the work plan and to highlight those things that are um, changed. Um, we've certainly reported the issues that you have raised already. Um, and so um, we'll be hearing that when we get to the action side. Great. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Fantastic. All right, I'm gonna walk us through what has changed in the work plan uh, and hopefully set up uh, some conversations based on what you all have, have already shared, some of you shared, and I think some of the uh, questions that have been raised in the past and some outstanding questions based on what we've heard so far. I wanna reiterate that um, the, the survey that you all filled out, while not definitive as far as a vote, was very helpful in us under for us understanding where interest for commissioners lie in understanding which topics to dive into um, and what type of uh, guest speakers we want to have um, uh, come to visit. Um, and I think that that is basically the first um, big change to the, the work plan. The, the rest of it uh, up to the meeting schedule was, was um, I, I think, unchanged. Um, I, I will say that um, the, the way that we've been approaching the, the research and analysis piece of this is to find experts um, and past participants in this process um, and those with lived experience governing in San Jose to help to answer some of these, these questions. And so I, I, uh, the, the process of, of finding those people, understanding their availability and getting them in the schedule um, is ongoing. And there's some folks that uh, you know, I think can be uh, a proxy to research, direct research, if not uh, part of that direct research. So that is one uh, tactic we are using um, to just respond to Commissioner Matsumura, but you know, totally understood that there might well be moments down the road where there is additional specific research necessary. 
So um, we are right now uh, March 8th, and um, we are going to talk about a little bit of history of previous charter review processes in San Jose and to better understand the historical context of the current commission. Uh, to do that, we had initially asked three past review, uh, uh, charter review commissioners. We'd asked uh, Blanca Alvarado uh, from the 1975 to 1976 commission, which had uh, put forth the recommendation to move to uh, district elections to join us. Unfortunately, uh, she double booked and was not able to, uh, to join us. Um, and uh, it also, um, I think, uh, was pretty clear that, that some of the specifics around community outreach um, uh, are, are, are difficult to, to, to remember specifically because of that, that, uh, the, that time span. So um, we do have joining us tonight, John Marshall Collins and Bob Brownstein, who both participated in the 1985 Charter Commission. Um, uh, Mr. Brownstein in particular has participated and listened in on, on your commission meetings and, and contributed. So um, these were recommendations made by a number of you as well as some outside uh, folks that, uh, that I reached out to. Uh, March 22nd, uh, we wanted to dig into the nuances between the council manager and mayor council forms of governments, which is probably the, the, the biggest issue that folks uh, really wanted to, to learn more about. Uh, and then, if at all possible, uh, present some research as it exists right now on the effectiveness of different models. I think effectiveness could be cost, uh, as we just heard someone speak about. It could be uh, policy impacts. Um, you know. Governance is a, is a challenging topic to, to understand, but there is some research out there. I've reached out to the National uh, Civic League. They have a, uh, um, a local governance program. There's others that we're, we're reaching out to, um, to to speak to that. But we also want to put together, and, and this is where one of the interns we have, uh, Karina, is helping us right now, put together a, a chart that a lot of you spoke to about um, the, the basic differences between uh, mayor council and council manager as far as the the specific breakdown of roles responsibilities and, and powers and authorities so we do hope to have um, that chart ready for you uh, by next monday to post ahead of this meeting if we can get a column based on uh, san jose in there as well uh, we have looked at some of the research that has been done by other cities and other commissions um, there's some good stuff out there. None of it is as comprehensive as you might think as far as like a, a really quick to read, quick and easy to read chart. So just know in our process, we're trying to leverage what else has already been, out, been done out there by different communities. Uh, on April 5th, um, we uh, had a, a, a deeper dive into San Jose's current system of governance and its practical implications. There are some specific sections of the city charter that some of y'all wanted to speak to. Um, in particular, Section 411, the council and interference with administrative matters, that sort of uh, bright red line between policy and, and, and staff implementation. And then digging into um, some of the specifics of how the, uh, the city organization functions um, in these articles. We have tentative acceptance from former city manager Deb Figuera, as well as former mayor Ron Gonzalez. And we have a few other invitations out. So. Um, We'll see who can join us there. But uh, again, trying to respond to your request to have actual uh, past electeds and, and um, administrative officials speak to, to the commission. Um, Lawrence, it's yeah. Figoni. Figoni. Oh, Figoni. Oh, I'm sorry. Gosh. Figoni. Yeah. This is well, everybody's like, Ooh. thank you. I don't remember her. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Apologies. Um, on April 19th, um, We've been talking a lot about sort of the, um, the other cities that uh, have gone through a similar process. So uh, walking through some case studies um, and um, if we can find some, some examples uh, or at least someone to, to guide us through what alternative or third forms of government are outside of mayor council um, and um, council manager forms, then we also wanted to include that on April 19th. And on May 3rd, we wanted to talk uh, uh, to two other topics that were very, um, um, popular is not the right word, but uh, uh, of interest, of, of the most interest to, to the folks that responded to the survey. Uh, power and accountability metrics and mechanisms for the various governance roles, uh, and also um, how the role of districts um, and how council members are elected um, has changed the, the power dynamics in, in San Jose. And I think this also gets into kind of the practical implications of, of the, the current model. Um, so those are the, the research topics that we've talked about. Um, the, the notion here has been to, to hold a public hearing of some kind. Um, 
I, I do think that uh, one of the things that has also come out in this process, which is going to be a conversation the commission needs to address, is that there are a number of folks we've already heard um, on tonight's call that uh, felt as if the public hearing should be hosted when there is the right moment, when there is a, a proposal to share, when there is a question to ask. Uh, in the community engagement section or community engagement approach, um, I tried to sort of highlight the need for us to be specific about what we are asking of the community in order to honor their participation. Um, so uh, that was when we had planned for the first public hearing, kind of a, um, a general feedback on um, what we've learned so far. But if you have thoughts on that, we'd love to hear them. And it's also a break point to get into the charter discussion. We're again relying on those three primary buckets that city council had mapped out for this commission, the overall governance structure uh, and election timing. Um, we thought that uh, after that, there would be, uh, after the, the commission has a chance to, to discuss initial questions, to go back out to the public and host a, a public hearing in language. Uh, on July 12th, there is a city clerk's uh, office um, break. Uh, they'll be out of the out of the office. So this is a proposed commission break as well to, to just respect Tony and her team. Uh, and then because that's also when the council is out for a number of weeks. And then um, basically this um, uh, bookmark for additional measures, what these additional measures look like, um, how they're decided upon, I, I assume will be emergent from the conversations that happen throughout the study sessions. And so I uh, I think that there's a, an invitation for you all to really decide, you know, where else do you want to go here as far as that uh, third bucket of accountability, transparency, and, and um, equity in, in uh, governance in San Jose. Uh, I don't think that there's any kind of consensus that I've heard about what those additional measures are. Um, and so this is something that will be an ongoing conversation. As Fred mentioned, um, we'll be updating the work plan as there is a, 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 a consensus or, or a, a a uh, strong direction or inclination from the commission. Uh, and then finally, another hearing on, on those additional measures and then move into the commission reports. Um, this is all tentative. We don't know how long it's gonna take to have some of these conversations or draft reports. Um, this is all fungible and flexible, but this is trying to mark out where we are so that we can move forward uh, and start to, to, to do this work together. The other section I've added here is the community engagement approach. I wanted to capture what has been talked about so far so that we're building basically a, um, an approach and a process uh, so that um, we can really hone our engagement chops and make sure that the, the right folks are being uh, integrated into this process and their, and their voice being heard uh, at the right points. So um, I call them touch points, but the commission website is an obvious one. Um, commission meetings is, is probably the most obvious one, and then public hearings. Uh, there may be other touch points, but I leave that for all uh, that for you all to decide. Um, and as far as what we are asking or the activities for uh, around those um, touch points, uh, my sense is that we want to be specific with the community about the asks, um, and we will need to develop those specific set of questions or asks for the community in our process here. Uh, so there's a lot of talk about public engagement. Um, I invite the commission to start to get specific about what that really means to whom and when and why. Um, and that's a really important question for any kind of community engagement um, uh, to move from the uh, intention and notion of involving folks to actually what it really looks like and, and, and when it happens and, and, and what we're talking about. So a couple of examples of what that could be, not definitive, but just as a, as a bookmark. The outreach, outreach activities that I'm tracking here, um, uh, this is incomplete compared to uh, what Tony shared tonight. The YouTube channel is not here, but just really want to bookmark what the city can offer. And if there's other um, ways the city can help promote the commission's work, then we'll, we'll track it here. Um, and uh, I will work with Tony and Megan to make sure that that it happens. Uh, commissioner outreach, um, we've talked a little bit in the past about, uh, and this part of the survey, who are you all? talking with now and um, who might you commit to uh, sharing the work of the commission with uh, on an ongoing basis, especially when there's a specific ask. Uh, and I'll get to the uh, appendix here at the very end, but this was the list of, of all the, the groups that have been brought up by folks 
uh, which becomes a working outreach list, a working stakeholder list for us to, to really leverage. Um, and uh, Fred and I, in our review of this, felt really good about the, all the connections and um, intentions you all brought to this list. And if we can, um, if we can really keep this list informed, then I think that's a pretty amazing thing and, and really gets us ahead of, of uh, uh, you know, potentially where even past commissions have been. Uh, and then finally, um, this section here, I think, speaks to some of the questions that have been brought out about budget. Um, I uh, phrased this uh, fairly um, uh, openly in order uh, to allow for that kind of very conversation. Uh, but I think that we heard loud and clear that the notion of community partners to uh, um, support the public engagement of this commission is, is probably going to be really important. And so just wanted to acknowledge that that is part of the burgeoning community engagement approach. And so it's, it's in, in the work, uh, work plan here as such. Uh, I also came up with some public messaging just as a first pass of how we talk about governance and charter reviews in a more plain language kind of way. Um, I had not seen Tony's language when I posted this. So um, apologies for the miscommunication there. Um, but I would welcome any feedback you have on this, but I, I do think uh, the question of um, how we talk about this uh, is really critical. Um, and uh, I appreciate uh, Commissioner Brosio's uh, continual um, revisiting the point of uh, strong versus weak is, is not a great framing. Um, and so this is one example of, of what it means to really get boil this down into the plain language necessary to, to talk to the public. So those are the changes we made to the work plan. Uh, we're gonna pause and um, what we'd like to do is just um, open up the floor to uh, questions from commissioners um, and then we'll have public comment and uh, a vote to approve the work plan. We do have um, a, uh, one of our, our guest speakers, John Marshall Collins has a hard stop at 745. Uh, um, Mr. Collins and Mr. Brownstein should be on the on the line right now. So if we start to go over too much, um, we might pause on that and come back just so we can honor their time. Um, but as uh, Chair Ferrer said, um, we've tried to structure the the agenda so that we have plenty of time to talk about um, you know motions to to uh, for action based on this uh, revisions to this work plan. Uh, okay, uh, sound good, Fred? Uh, you're muted. Yes, we can um, pause and come back after there are visitors. Um, and I'm going to also ask that folks, the cameras are having a hard time saying who's speaking. So when I call on you, if you could just say your name first, and that way the camera can find, your, find you in your name quicker so that folks know who's speaking. So appreciate that. And um, Lawrence, I'm going to turn it back over to you. I see there are a couple hands up. If yep. people do want to ask questions or make a comment, um, please make sure you raise your hand and we'll try to go through everyone. Yeah, and I'm going to try and make sure that everyone has a chance to speak once before someone speaks twice. Um, but right now I see um, Commissioner Callender and then Commissioner Percival. All right, first of all, I, I want to compliment you, Lawrence, all the work that you did on this. I think there's a lot of work that went into it. I think it does capture a lot of the things that we talked about. And I do see the community partners and Hopefully, we'll, uh, the staff will be able to recommend the budget for the community partnership portion for outreach. I think that'll just make us more successful uh, here. One of the things that I did want to note is on April 5th, we, is when we start to talk to the guts of really some of the matters that we'll be considering, I wanted to suggest that on the 22nd, we open it up for the public to talk about what are the things that they would like to see from us. Because if we're informed about the different areas that the public would like to see, that would control, that would basically feed into the fifth so that we can make sure, so we'll be able to see the entire breadth of what we're doing and be able to plan it out. Under the work plan as it exists right now, we would be doing additional things way at the end and we'd be jamming ourselves. If we know the, if we know the size of the elephant that we, have to, that we have to deal with right in the beginning, then we can plan it out a little bit better. So, so Mr. Chairman, I don't know what the proper way to do this. I don't wanna make a motion, but I, do, I would like to invite the public to come in and say, on the charter, we'd like you to look at A, B, C, D, and E. I'm, I'm really not sure what the public wants to see from us. I do know the council said to look at the things that you have on April 5th, but I think the public also should have the opportunity to drive our discussion so we can plan it out a little better. So Mr. Chairman, I'll look to you uh, on how you wanna handle if you want just comments and then we look to motions in the end. I think we'll just look to motions in the end just so we can hear folks. Just remember that all of our meetings, the public does have access to make public comments. So just remember that a public hearing is not the only way we can do it, but 
that we'll hear that that those, those feedback along the way. Um, thanks, though. We'll just wait till the end, and then I'll I'll look for motions. Uh, Commissioner Percival. Yeah, thank you, uh, and thank you, Lawrence, for that presentation. I just had a, a comment, and maybe we can talk about this um, later. But I would suggest uh, adjusting the our conversations, our analysis of the timing of elections, and moving it to, moving it up. Actually, um, the I see the two is very connected between the timing and the structure of government in terms of who actually elects, let's say, a more powerful mayor um, and how, you know, how broad that participation is. So I think in terms of the um, discussion on the third of accountability, uh, who elects or, or how members of the council are elected, I think it'd be important to introduce the timing of elections not only to the commission, but also to the broader community, because those two those two things are, are are very closely linked. I think discussing one without the other would be um, not not give us, but also the more you know, just as importantly, the public a, a sense of how those two matter. Great, appreciate that. Thank you. Other um, comments, questions uh, on the the work plan as it stands right now. Uh, Commissioner Barroso and then uh, Vice Chair Johnson. Okay, thank you, Luis Barroso. So my, my comments are around the dates um, and uh, especially in the times where it does jump, right? For example, um, we did jump uh, just recently, right? We went from not seeing each other for a while and that's gonna happen again with Memorial Day and possibly um, in July again. So I wonder, I don't know what the solution is, is maybe when we can't meet on a certain Monday because we're on off, on off, maybe right after the Monday that we can't meet, the following Monday is when we meet, right? As opposed to keep jumping off and on, or if we can't meet that Monday because it's a federal or state holiday um, that we're observing, we move the Monday meeting to a Tuesday. So it's still, the beginning of the work week uh, per se, but not a Monday. So I don't have the solution, but I just propose that because I think once we start getting into the crux of things, um, we do miss a lot of discussion time if we keep jumping from month to month to month when we observe a holiday. Great. That's it, thank you. Duly noted, thank you. Uh, Vice Chair. Christina Johnson. Um, so I had a question about uh, Commissioner Matsumura's memo. I know that we had a motion um, to integrate this into the work plan and I don't really see it in here. So so I was wondering why that was, because I thought that she set out a um, pretty good plan about doing community engagement process. Um, and then I also have a question about the date about doing community engagement. I mean, if we really want to be intentional and have a robust engagement process, we need to be reaching out to CBOs already. And you know, we, we need people to have enough time to um, talk to folks and get them ready to be involved in this meeting. And so I have a question about that one too. So thank you. Thank you. And can I just ask for you to, uh, anything in particular that from uh, Commissioner Matsumura's memo that's not in here so that I can understand where, you know, where, where we, we missed that or, or what specifics you'd like to see? <laughs> Yeah, so one of the things was, um, you know, additioning training around the Brown Act for commissioners. I think that would be useful because I'm still understanding, you know, what it means to be a commissioner, who I can talk to, who I can't talk to. And I feel like because I, I didn't really, I don't really understand those parameters, I've kind of been limited in um, who, who I'm talking to about this and getting ideas. So that's one. Um, and then she also mentioned evidence informed best and promising practices for representation, including accountability, um, you know, practice the date that the city has used that has been really effective. Like I would want to know more about that to see how we in, uh, can incorporate that into this process. Yeah. Okay. Um, we, uh, we can definitely add more around that and look into it. Um, we did have, um, um, Mark Vani, the city attorney, speak a little bit more about the Brown Act. So we tried to address that concern there. Um, and we also had um, Poncho and Camille speak about, they weren't evidence-based practices, but they were 
practitioners and the community engagement that you know, we we're trying to actually meet the spirit of Commissioner Matsumura's memo. So um, if there are other specific ways that we can get you the information that you're interested in, you know, I think like at this point specifics is, is great and we will do our best to, to accommodate that, but definitely noted, um, you know, the those and, and we'll see what we can do next time around on this. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Fuentes. Thank you. This is uh, Maria Fuentes. And I was thinking that um, I like the, the basic outline and the information that um, that's been presented on the work plan. And for me, I would like to hear, um, I know Bob Brownstein is already here. And I, I don't know if John Marshall Collins is here, but I really would like to hear their experience um, with the charter review process, because I think that that will inform us in um, in where we go with our plan. And I mean, there are some real specific things that I, I want to comment on, particularly related to the plan and, and how we implement it. But but I really am interested in hearing our speakers so we can ask them questions if um, there's areas that we want to know more about and and help us as we proceed. Great. They are on they are on the line and waiting. Uh, Commissioner Tron and Commissioner Amador. Oh, uh, I got it. Okay. Um, I think this is which ran. I'll, I'll, I'll keep the question focused so we can go to the um, presenters. Uh, in terms of the data, how the data gets presented, um, and where you're drawing your data from, are you focusing on on cities of a certain size uh, to, 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 to analyze and research before this information gets presented back to the commission? Yeah, commissioners have made a request uh, to um, hear about the process of similar sized communities going through a similar, um, um, uh, similar set of questions, you know, uh, basically uh, uh, evaluating a, not a strong mayor, but a, a mayor council. Um, so yeah, that's been the request and um, uh, yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Commissioner Amador. Yes, this is Veronica Amador. Um, and my question goes, will this be translated into different languages? Um, and also, do we need to make a motion just to make sure that we don't forget to use, um, so we can start using uh, more of different uh, governance styles rather than strong and weak. Um, would that need to be added to a motion and as well as survey? I know that we're talking about the outreach and we this is open to the community. However, many of our community members might not know how to do how to get in, how to log in or might not have the time. Um, can we put something such as a survey out there where they're able to put in their comments, right? I know that we have emails, which is not really the same um, because some people might not know how to use an email rather than a survey. It's a lot easier to as well just um, share around. Thank you. Got it. Thank you. And I, I can't speak to whether this will be translated. Um, and when you say this, you mean the work plan, right? Yeah, got it. Uh, anyone else that wants to speak now before we have our guests join? Um, we'll take two more. I see Commissioner Matsumura and Commissioner Sanchez, and then we'll hit pause and come back to questions and, and discussion um, after after uh, new business. We'll return to old business after the new business. Uh, Commissioner Matsumura. You actually just answered the question that I have, so uh, thank you for that. Okay, great. And Commissioner Sanchez, uh, you're on mute. I want to echo uh, some of Rick's uh, comments that he made uh, earlier, and, and then uh, being a novice uh, to the uh, to the um, committee here, um, in terms of civic engagement, what type of information can we? And I know I know, I know we're at the at the beginning of, of the whole process, but what kind of information do we want to present to the organizations out there, the individuals who who want to let us know what their thoughts are concerning this uh, this committee? So I think we, we have to take a look at how, at how we want to do that. How, how do we want to present the message out there so that people understand what, what the commission's about, the purpose of it, the mission, and then the input that they can have with us. So I, I don't know, maybe, maybe we, we can start taking a look at how best we can do uh, that 
anyway, but I think we have to explore that a little bit. Those are my comments. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Uh, and welcome aboard. Um, okay, so we're going to pause on this right now. Um, uh, Tony, if you could make um, Mr. Collins and Mr. Brownstein um, uh, panelists. Yeah, Megan's already moved them over. Okay. Uh, all right. So we see, I see, um, there they are. Great. Okay. Uh, I would like to welcome uh, a whole new world of Zoom. Uh, I'd like to welcome um, our, our two guest panelists tonight, um, Robert Brownstein and uh, John Marshall Collins, both participants in the 1985 uh, Charter Review Commission. And uh, they have graciously agreed to share their experience. And what I'd like to do, gentlemen, is to put two questions to you. We'll have you both respond to, to the first question. Um, and then we'll have you both respond to the second question. And then we'll have time for, for um, uh, questions from the commissioners. The, the first question, I'll read both questions and then we'll have your, your responses to the first question. Um, the, the first question is based on a, a lot of interest from commissioners. Uh, what was the historical context for why your commission was founded? Uh, and if you could share, since you'll be both speaking about the, the same commission, uh, you know, if you have any other nuances to, to, to share to start, uh, we can do that. But uh, Mr. Collins, I'll start with you. Okay. So you're looking for the historical context? Yeah, why was, why was the 1985 commission founded? What were the questions you were, you were tasked with asking? Well, I, I think uh, in large part, there was a, a, a perception and an argument going on in the community uh, about the uh, level of uh, power that was uh, enjoyed by the bureaucracy. Uh, and the, the uh, perception on the part of some people that uh, it really didn't matter a huge amount what the uh, uh, council members were bringing to the table, uh, supposedly you know representing uh, elements of the community, uh, didn't make a, a, a big as big a difference there as what the city manager thought or what a particular department head thought. Uh, and, uh, you know, I mean, this is not an unusual, uh, uh, even then was not an unusual uh, discussion because a lot of uh, bigger cities and at that time in 85, San Jose was becoming a bigger city. Uh, a lot of bigger cities uh, do it a different way and, and, and are not so devoted to a city manager uh, situation. And of course, if you look around uh, American politics, uh, almost everything bigger than a city is run in somewhat of a different way. Some counties definitely use a sort of a county executive, which is very similar to city manager. But above that, in, in state legislatures and in the, in the United States government, obviously nobody in the bigger uh, areas uh, employs uh, uh, someone who has the kind of, of uh, clout that the city manager has. So uh, uh, at that time, we certainly had a, a uh, mayor who felt very strongly about uh, uh, his ability to lead and that that was uh, impeded. And so I think uh, Mayor McHenry was basically the uh, uh, person who was uh, to an extent uh, behind the organization of a charter review commission that had a purview that included, uh, you know, a re-exploration of the city manager form of government versus the council mayor form of government. And within that, uh, uh, certainly, uh, there was a lot of talk about whether, uh, I mean, at, at that time, the mayor's office had, was kind of like the 11th vote on the council. And I, I think people who've been involved in politics over the last 15 or 20 years would say, well, that's not true anymore. Uh, the mayor, uh, uh, is now, uh, more than just an 11th vote on the council. 
uh, and that's the re that was sort of the result prior to 85, prior to Measure J, which passed as a result of our uh, uh, commission and others uh, uh, work. Um, the, the, the mayor was more of a presiding officer and less of a leader. And when that got done, that had been adjusted and ratcheted up some. And I, I think you guys might like to hear, uh, I don't know if you're planning to hear from uh, ex-mayor McHenry. Unfortunately, uh, ex-mayor Hammer is not with us anymore. So we can't get her impressions. I heard that Ron Gonzalez is going to come and speak, and I'm sure that uh, uh, our current mayor will also uh, have some uh, uh, ability to be heard here. Uh, but that, that in my mind, is, was the historical context. Fantastic. Thank you. And we have reached out to Mayor McHenry um, waiting to, to hear back. So um, uh, great. Thank you so much, Mr. Collins. We'll come back to you. Uh, Mr. Brownstein, um, would you care to share your thoughts on the historical context, the, the task that the 85 Commission um, was put to? Uh, sure. Good evening, everyone. Um, I think the 1985 Commission uh, was created to deal with two major issues of um, governance that were being played out in the city of San Jose. Um, the first issue was the question of how much power the city manager had in relationship to the legislative body, the mayor and city council. The second question what, is what was the breadth and depth of representation that was provided by that city council to the different constituencies that lived in San Jose. Um, so let's do one at a time. In the early 1980s, San Jose was a traditional city manager city. Um, uh, the city council members were part-time. They were paid less than $400 a month. They had no personal staff. The city manager had a political base, the old guard in San Jose, and had complete control of information and the ability to do deep analysis of public policy issues. And people who look at the model we have today can't really appreciate the extent to which the city manager was a dominant force back in those old days. I mean, I remember one time a different city manager from a different city, Tom Lukak, city manager from Sunnyvale, ruled with an iron hand. I was once at a meeting where I mentioned uh, uh, an idea that I think Supervisor Susie Wilson had. Um, and he erupted, what? You're proposing something from an elected official? An elected official has a policy idea? It was like I had told him that a squirrel in my backyard had given me uh, a public policy idea. Now, today, it's a totally different world. Uh, council members and the mayor routinely uh, launch public policy initiatives. Um, they, uh, they have staff, they have the ability to do analytical work. And um, uh, really, the city manager is reduced to trying to struggle through priority setting sessions to make sure that the work that they give his people isn't so overwhelming that they collapse from an inability um, to do it all. Um, what the 1985 commission did to, in terms of this issue was to define the mayor as the political leader of the city, give the mayor some additional budgetary authority, uh, create an office of policy analysis to do research for the council. That office has since been abandoned uh, and also gave the council the ability uh, to uh, affirm or reject uh, new appointments for department heads. So essentially what it did was it gave the mayor the ability to be a, a strong political leader um, if the mayor had the capacity to form a coalition of the members of the city council. And um, from my perspective, once that capacity was given to the mayor and mayors have taken it since then, the issue of the relationship between the legislative body and the city manager has largely been resolved in San Jose to the overwhelming, an overwhelming victory of the legislative body. You can still tweak it here and there, but basically the legislature is in charge um, and the city manager knows it every day of the week. Uh, <laughs> the second um, issue, the depth of representation, that's an issue that um, had its roots in the fact that in the 1970s, the city council was elected at large 
almost all members were white. Almost all of them came from the most affluent districts and most of them did not work for a living. Um, they did not represent the full diversity of San Jose. That was changed through district elections. Unfortunately, Blanc Alvarado isn't here to talk about the charter commission that dealt with that issue. Um, but district elections started to move the council towards a more representative role. And in 1985, really, you had the first generation of district elected officials who were just getting their feet wet and, uh, and, and learning the ropes. Um, but as I look at what has happened um, since 1985, I have to conclude that although there has been some significant improvements in the area of representation, they haven't been nearly enough. Yes, there's more diversity on the city council, but the fact is it was only last year, last year, 30 years after, um, actually 35 years after the 1985 commission that the council finally started to talk about having explicit racial equity objectives in San Jose. Um, so there's still a lot of work to do on the representation and equity front. And that's an area where I think um, the issue is not fundamentally resolved. That's one where a future city charter commission, uh, AKA you guys, um, can uh, can make some uh, initiatives and uh, help resolve uh, what we were were unable to fix adequately back in 1985. Fantastic, thank you. So let's go to um, the second question, um, and uh, we'll hear from both of you, and then we'll open it up to questions from the commissioner. Uh, commissioners, given your experience serving on the 1985 commission in the past. What recommendations do you have for this commission as it looks at governance structure and, and what it's been tasked with? So any recommendation you have for, for this commission? Uh, and uh, Mr. Collins, we'll, we'll go back to you. So the question is recommendations that we might have as to the outcome or the process? Uh, both, I think, you know, as, as folks have been through the rodeo, um, you know, what would you, what would you offer this commission as far as their, the task ahead of them? Okay, well, there's nothing uh, um, that would be more, uh, more disappointing and frustrating for the commission than to uh, spend uh, what appears to be a year uh, or more in this process, and then find that it doesn't have enough support on the city council to put a measure on the ballot to change the charter, which is what has to happen. Uh, uh, in the end, the commission, uh, obviously our commission and your commission, uh, don't have any direct power to do this. Uh, uh, the, there has to be uh, support for it on the city council. So one recommendation I would certainly make uh, is, is that, that I, I believe, if I understand the way things have gone this year, that, that most of you are appointed by a, a single council member. Is that right? Yes. Uh, and uh, so I think everyone has to take the responsibility to keep in touch with that council member, the person that, that appointed you, and maybe to keep in touch with a few other people on the council, or maybe to keep in touch with the mayor or people who are on the mayor's staff. There, there needs to be, and I'm not saying that you should be directed by, by these folks, but it, it will be a giant waste of time if you do something that can't get uh, six votes on the council or maybe seven or however many it takes to uh, put something on the ballot. Uh, at, at the time uh, of the last, uh, uh, not the last one maybe, but the one I sat on in 1985, uh, I know we, uh, we all, uh, engaged in quite a bit of, of discussion with our various council members. And I don't think, any, I've looked around at the, count, at, at the commission, many old friends, by the way, hello to all of you. Uh, and I don't think anybody, there's anybody there that's gonna get pushed around by the council uh, or take direction from the council. That's obviously not your role. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, uh, it, it's it's good to have some mutual communication there. Uh, 
and it, it may be the most useful communication you have because those actually are people who sort of know what the the problems are that they're, that are they're trying to solve right now. The another comment I would make uh, is that that you know you definitely want to have plenty of public input into this and, and transparency and those things are all important. On the other hand, when it comes to these uh, kind of uh, abstruse political science questions that you guys are trying to solve, uh, there's not a lot of uh, deep knowledge out there uh, among the community. So uh, you have to be very careful to, to focus uh, community comments and try to find out what, uh, you know, what they would like and also what they wouldn't like. Uh, so that you don't wind up with something that can't pass in an election or that has a lot of uh, 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 problems associated with it. Uh, and it's hard to get community comments on this. I also served on the 1990 uh, commission that redistricted San Jose. And boy, we, I mean, <laughs> redistricting brings out terrific or perhaps emotional comments. I mean, there are a lot of well-defined groups. There are people doing research. There are people, you know, but there's not all, uh, you can't just go to a community group and say, what do you think about governance in San Jose? With it, people have to get prepared for that. So uh, it's not necessarily uh, uh, true that you're going to get too much out of the out of the public meetings, even though they're absolutely necessary and appropriate. Um, so that, those are kind of my, uh, my thoughts at a, at a, a process level. Uh, in, in the end of, of our commission, uh, there was some disagreement. Uh, and, and the disagreement uh, centered around uh, how far we would go to harness the bureaucracy. And there were some, pro some uh, uh, proposals uh, that uh, perhaps with submerging from the mayor's office were dropped at the last minute. Uh, and whether those would have been good ideas or not, I don't know. Uh, Bob and I were both involved in that process and, and uh, in, in the end voted in the minority on, on dropping those proposals. Uh, but uh, uh, you also have to figure out how, how much impact you're going to allow uh, uh, voices on the council or the mayor's office to have. Um, I think Bob is absolutely right that, that, that even though it didn't go quite as far as I thought it should at the time, uh, that, that the, the uh, ultimate result of, of the 1985 charter changes was, was to resolve the issue of uh, you know, who's in charge here mm -hmm. and uh, appropriately left it in, in, the, in the hands of the people who were actually elected. Uh, not uh, in the hands of, of, of uh, unelected uh, bureaucrats. Um, so, you know, they, they, you can tweak that. Uh, and it, it, I probably no longer would give too much extra power to the mayor, although I was a strong advocate for it 35 years ago. Um, uh, but, but I do think Bob's comment about... Uh, 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 seeking uh, new forms of equity, uh, and, and it's it's not the easiest thing in the world to do to figure out exactly how to change a governance structure to to seek that. Uh, to some extent, district elections and and the way districts are set up and so forth was intended to to help that and it did help that, but, but uh, that's, uh, that's the real challenge to you guys now is to, to actually see what you can do uh, that, would, that would work, that would make things better in that direction. Fantastic, thank you, Mr. Collins, appreciate it. Hold tight, we're gonna have um, Mr. Brownstein share his recommendations and they'll take some questions before you have to leave. Mr. Brownstein. Um, 
So, I mean, I would certainly agree with John that you, you need to have reality tests in your thinking. You don't want to come up with something that the council will totally reject. You don't want to come up with something that the city voters will totally reject. Uh, but on the other hand, I think you should um, view yourselves as playing a leadership role and a problem solving role. You are the um, city commission enterprise. You are going to go where no commission has gone before. You are going to invent um, some new charter language. That's what we did in 1985. The hybrid model that San Jose developed is not one that is done anywhere else. And I think it has stood, a lot of it has stood the test of time and is, uh, and demonstrated that it's a very, very valid uh, uh, approach to governance. Um, other advice that I would give is uh, uh, you want to maintain a, a capacity for independence. You definitely want to have your own counsel um, to uh, advise you on, uh, on drafting. Um, when you're thinking about models of governance, always remember that the structure of governance is a tool, not an end. You want to develop criteria through which you can evaluate different structures of government. And when you're thinking about criteria, you need to pay attention to the nuances and the details. I mean, you're, you know, the council has told you to care about things like accountability and representation. Fine, those are very few structures of government have a, those kinds of effects that are universal. Accountability for whom, to whom, a, a representation for whom. Um, you're going to have to think about those questions. To what extent you're, are you going to try and increase the representation for people who are powerful and organized or for people who aren't? Um, I think you, uh, you also want to take into consideration the fact that there are different, very different skill sets for the different roles that people play in the politics and governance of a city like San Jose. And the three main categories that I would suggest thinking about are campaigning, governing, and managing. They're all different. Campaigning involves the ability to put together messages, be likable, um, uh, have the ability to communicate well with many, many individuals. Governing involves the ability to build coalitions, to merge interests, to resolve disputes, to promote a vision. Managing involves employing resources effectively to accomplish objectives, to monitor and enforce performance. Um, all of these are different. They require different kinds of abilities. They're, once in, a, in an age, you find somebody who has all three. In most cases, you don't find anybody who has all three. Um, so you want to be thinking about those um, as, a, as, you go, um, as you go forward. Um, so that would be some suggestions. I'm not going to, you will, you will hear from me later in this process about specific recommendations for governance changes, uh, but not now. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, we appreciate uh, your involvement uh, to date and, and both you and uh, Mr. Collins being with us tonight. Let's take some questions. Uh, and um, Mr. Collins has to leave in 15 minutes. So if anybody has any specific questions for him, uh, maybe we could start there, but uh, you know, would love to just um, have all your curious, curious questions answered best we can right now. If you could raise your hand, we'll start. Don't all step forward at once. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Commissioner Trent. Hi, uh, Don and, and uh, uh, Bob, I love listening to you guys talk. Um, there's actually a lot of context there that uh, is very helpful, at least for me. Uh, so I wanted to pose this question here just to get your opinion about this. One of the justifications for expanding on the mayor's powers was that the mayor could then respond to demands that occurred last summer uh, regarding the termination of the police chief. Um, the mayor then said he didn't have that authority that all fell within the city manager's responsibility. I mean, you both seem to be very, you know, you both are advocates for the current system that we have in place and not expanding the powers too much, but do you believe that a mayor should have the power to change department heads in such a direct and quick way? Well, uh, that, that was the, uh, the, um, the rock upon which some of the, the ships foundered uh, in 1985. Uh, the was the, the question of 
whether the mayor or the mayor and the council would have the right to relieve department heads, of whom one would have been the, the police chief, but uh, there's also, you know, was the planning director and, and things of that nature. Um, and uh, if I remember correctly, I know I did, and I believe Bob uh, was a, a very strong supporter of, of a proposition that would have given the mayor and council uh, more power over, over department heads. Uh, possibly the, the power to uh, relieve them, uh, possibly even uh, some kind of a, an every one or two year review process uh, mm -hmm. where if a, 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 a department head was not uh, favorably reviewed enough uh, uh, or if it was unfavorable, then there would be a process to go through where ultimately they could wind up uh, being relieved of their duties. So uh, uh, that that was uh, uh, out there as a as a, uh, a suggestion. Uh, it uh, initially uh, we had a couple of votes, and uh, that initially passed, and then eventually was subtracted. Uh, so the the question of whether I would want the mayor alone to be able to fire, to fire the police chief is one that I'd have to give some thought to. But whether the mayor and the council acting in concert should be able to fire the police chief seems like a self-evident proposition. And in fact, uh, you know, uh, the fact of the matter probably is that, that even now, if, if the mayor and five members of the council seriously wanted to fire the police chief, uh, they could get the city manager to do it because they do have the power to fire the city manager. Uh, so what you're really hearing when you hear those kind of things coming back to you, and I don't know what these conversations were, but you might be kind of hearing that I, I don't want to do that or I, I don't want to exercise my political power to accomplish that goal. Uh, it, it, and it, but one of the things you all could be looking at is whether you want to make that power more overt and more direct uh, so that the, 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 either the mayor or the mayor plus a majority of the council could uh, uh, fire a department head, fire the police chief. And uh, in these days where the police situation is is such a crucial and, and difficult situation. Uh, uh, that's definitely uh, an important issue. Go ahead, uh, Mr. Brownstein, please. Thank you. Um, the, uh, remember when I talked about those two objectives that we were dealing with back in 1985, the relationship between the legislature and the uh, administration and also the issue of depth of representation. Those are two very, very related issues. And the challenge is to be able to make sure that if you're making a change in the first one, it doesn't have negative effects in the second one. So you want to be careful that you don't create an ability for the mayor to be able to fire, for example, fire a police chief and do it against the representation of the public and the city council. In other words, eight members of the council and the public overwhelmingly want to keep the police chief, the mayor in the second term, virtually no accountability. Uh, he's never going to run for mayor again. He's termed out, decides he wants to fire the guy. That's a very non-representative act that you're allowing the mayor to do if you give the mayor that kind of structural power. Now, you merge the two much more um, if you create a scenario in which the mayor and the majority or supermajority of the city council is necessary in order to fire a department head. And um, if you want to be even more careful in terms of representation, you can um, create a set of circumstances in which that can be done, but the circumstances are not the universe of all circumstances. Like, you know, in, a, in an emergency, um, uh, the council and mayor can do that in a routine time. They can't. Um, so you have to, you know, you have to create some conditions um, that uh, enable that power uh, 
uh, to be exercised. But uh, the general message that I would give is um, always pay attention to the relationship between um, these two factors, because if, if one doesn't, it's very possible that the, the goal of efficiency and in some nebulous sense accountability will be achieved at, the, at a high price in terms of representation. Great, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Marshman, I saw you had your hand up. Um, did you have a question? I think we, she may not be here. So I'll move on to- Actually, I, I am here, sorry. I could Oh yeah. Um, I was going to ask what hung you up the first time, what, what it was that was shelved that you guys supported. So that was my question. This is all fascinating. I hope you <laughs> continue uh, monitoring and chatting with us. But I mean, as, I re as I recall, there was a proposal to allow the mayor and city council to fire a department head, and it had majority support on the council until the very last meeting, at which point uh, somehow several people changed their position and it was defeated. Um, so that's the way I recall. Uh, John, I don't know if you remember it any differently. Uh, no, that's absolutely how I remember it. And, and uh, uh, in my judgment at the time, it came right out of the mayor's office and was, uh, even though it would have improved the, the mayor's uh, position, was deemed to be uh, you know, a bridge too far for the public. Really? That was the argument. <laughs> okay. Yeah, interesting because uh, there was, I mean, Mayor McHenry never saw a power that he didn't want to have. I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> and he's a great guy, but I mean, he thought that the mayor should be the guy who could really lead the city. Right. But uh, my recollection is that it was, uh, uh, it was uh, Mayor McHenry who basically was behind those switched votes. Huh. So it goes. That is interesting. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, so I have um, on our stack here, Commissioners Percival, Monley, and Fuentes. So uh, Commissioner Percival, if you're still with us. You may yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you, John and Bob, for your um, really helpful comments. And it's great. It's great to hear um, your suggestions and also sort of what you, what you worked on um, a number of years ago now. Um, I just had a question, um, more thinking along the lines of uh, trust in in local government. Um, you know, overall, the public has routinely showed declining levels of trust in all forms of government. It used to be the local government was the most trusted level, but even that is now uh, declining. So I'm wondering if you, um, back in 1985, you know, thought about trust in government and how. Uh, the institutions of the organization of San Jose city government either helped contribute to that or inhibited it in some way. And it seems like that's, at least in my mind anyway, central to our work here is you know, how do we build a, a San Jose city government that contributes to a greater sense of, of trust and responsiveness to, to public demands. So thank you. I think, uh, I think that's a very good question. And uh, and that isn't just because you and I both have a big beard, uh, <laughs> but uh, that that helps. Um, I I think that when you're dealing with trust in government, uh, you've you've got a couple of, uh, of problems, and one of them is 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 gigantic and and very hard to solve in one local uh, position, and that is that that one party or one part of one party. Uh, has uh, undertaken to uh, undermine public trust in government for the last 30, 40 years. Uh, and uh, uh, eventually uh, uh, Ronald Reagan in particular spoke for that and then people have gone on to speak for it again and, and uh, it, it has eroded uh, public trust in, in government for no good reason. Now, there are, there are things that have happened, many things that have happened that were not good for trust in government otherwise, that weren't the product of, of, of this effort. Uh, and, and heaven knows we can, you know, the, the, you know, if you want to have people trust you, one of the things you have to do is be trustworthy. 
and government isn't always trustworthy and sometimes things seem to be organized from the background and and often they seem to be organized for the benefit of a particular person or persons uh and sometimes those are rich people uh and people with economic power uh, more, more often than not so those things all diminish trust and and to to develop a mechanism to to make that better would be terrific on the other hand you've got this this giant national messaging machine with 5,000 uh, uh, nonprofits out there doing research, uh, uh, basically trying to show that, that uh, you know, the one thing you don't want to hear is I'm from the government and I'm here to help you. That's one of their jokes that they've written over the years. So, you know, uh, uh, the, the trust issue was also an issue uh, when when we were working on this. Uh, it's, many people hoped at that time uh, that the, that some part of the the trust issue uh, that was the result of of having uh, basically all or many mostly men, mostly white people, mostly well off people on the council was going to change with the uh, change from uh, at large elections to district elections. And although it was not instant, that has in fact changed to where we, uh, we now have a more representative council. It's taken quite a while and it's, it's, it's not instant and it doesn't, uh, you know, at one point we were the feminist capital of the world and then for a while there weren't so many women and now I think we've gotten back a little bit. Uh, we, we, you know, different, uh, I mean, council seats are, are, are like quantum bits, you know, they're either here or there. Uh, the, the, the council generally can't be held by a person who is both Hispanic and Asian, uh, who, you know, people fit into one category or another, and you've only got 10 seats. If you had 100 seats, you could have actual, you know, logically, it could, it could bust down into, uh, you know, a definite representation. But of course, it's impossible to have 100 seats, and it's, uh, it wouldn't even be desirable to be too too much but we all we all thought that it would ha that it would have a positive impact on public trust and i think it has the problem is is that, that the 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 forces against public trust have also been very very large and very difficult to deal with uh, it's, it's, it's an excellent question um in my mind, there's no question that the level of trust has declined, um, even at the local level where it's been maintained the most. Um, and I don't know a magic wand solution for it, but I will give one observation from having been involved in local government and local politics since 1978. Um, and that is one thing that people very much want and need from their government is not just outcomes, but a sense that they have been heard and that they have been represented. That is that their point of view has been articulated. And that, it took me a long time to, to, to learn that because I was very much an outcome person. And I thought, I'm gonna work hard to give people what they really need and then they're gonna be happy. And it, didn't, it doesn't happen necessarily that way. Um, they wanna know that you've seriously listened to what they have to say, that you have, even if you've disagreed with it, that you've done very serious work to try and understand what they're saying. And if you're rejecting it, there are good reasons for it. And it's a kind of respect that they want. And if they don't get it, then they feel that the government isn't representing them and a level of, uh, uh, of trust is, uh, is eroded. Now, I'm not saying it's e in a big city, I'm not saying it's easy to do that, but to the extent to which we can, I think we will move back towards some greater level of trust. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I've got Commissioners Monley, Fuentes, and Matsumura. And Mr. Collins, if you need to, to drop off. Great, thank uh, you. Thank you very much. Sure. I'm wondering well, I'll go for could... one more question if okay. I may. Great, fantastic. Uh, Commissioner What's Monley. That? Uh, just, uh, Mr. Collins is gonna stick around for, for your question, Commissioner Monley, and then he's gonna drop off. Sorry about that. 
I'm not, did you say for me to go ahead? You can go ahead now. Okay, yes, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I'm wondering if you, uh, Mr. Collins and Mr. Brownstein, if you had uh, during your time on the commission in 1985, if you had a time or an opportunity to uh, have scenario um, uh, work uh, workouts or play scenario games, you get a council, uh, a mayor that can deliver a strong coalition or the opposite or um, I think it might be helpful to us in our deliberative process to know how you may have come to your um, your your recommendations in the end. Oh, I stayed for that, huh? <laughs> <laughs> am I? Am I? Did I ask that question in a roundabout way? No, no. The the question was great. Uh, it's just a hard question. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, does, yeah. to some extent, uh, there was a certain amount of uh, uh, discussion among members of the council, I mean, of the commission, uh, and uh, that, that, you know, arguments, if you will, that uh, to some extent took place outside of the commission meetings. Uh, I don't know about uh, how, how, uh, whether you guys are brown acted or not. Uh, I don't remember that we were, uh, it's a big group and, and, uh, certainly no, but there was no, no meetings of a majority, but there used to be a certain number of people who would, uh, get together afterwards. And I think those were useful, uh, discussions, uh, that helped people to kind of hone their arguments and, and uh, so forth. There's nothing formal about that. It's just, you know, sort of people who knew each other and so forth. Uh, but uh, uh, in answer to one part of your questions, I don't remember ex that we, you know, game, gamed it out in any kind of scenario situation. Although there's certainly on the, on the commission, there was a great deal of argument in which people would say, if you do it this way, this is going to be the result. Okay. Uh, and that's a sort of a scenario situation, but it, it wasn't very formal. Um, that's as best I can answer that's that. And, and I, I'm sorry, I've reached the, my, my limit. Oops. So I, Glad thank I got you, you all before for you leave. Uh, hearing from me and, and I wish you all the best. It's a hard job you've got. Thank you, Mr. Collins. John, for coming. Yeah. I really appreciate your time. <clears throat> Thanks for being here. The only thing I would add to John's comment on that, which I think was accurate, is that there, there, as I remember, there was a lot of what for a better term I'd call genuine philosophical discussion in that commission. I mean, we were talking about democracy. We were talking about representation and we were trying to figure out how those philosophical terms and objectives could be implemented in real structures in a, in a city. <clears throat> and, um, and, and those were serious discussions and, and we had them. Now, I don't remember us doing any kind of formal scenario games playing and stuff like that. I think tendencies towards doing it that way happened later in the world. But, uh, um, but, but we did have robust debates and, and they were about um, these values um, that we were trying to uh, agree on and find a way to incorporate into a, into a charter. Thank All right. you. Thank you. So uh, we have, uh, where did my list go? Oh, uh, Commissioner Fuentes, uh, Matsumura, and then Commissioner Diep. Okay, thank you, um, Maria Fuentes. Um, hi, Bob, nice to see you. And also, you know, I don't know, I think John's probably gone, but thank you. Um, this has been extremely um, helpful, I think, um, to, I mean, Bob, as you were talking about um, how things were and the issue that um, that you were dealing with in terms of the way that, you know, that gap between the power of the city manager versus the people, you know, all the, the representatives and that 
um, this, you know, the, you know, your commission really took on that that um, that really huge problem, and and were able to to address it. And um, I I um, I am, and 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 it it really has made a difference. I mean, both the district elections and then this following having the district election, having city council members that really represented our entire city, and then empowering them to really be able to have the say over what, what happens in government is, you know, is just vital to our, to our city. And um, I'm just thinking, you know, and I think of our charge that our group has to really, we have to figure out how to look at the questions that were given to us. And and what we really need to do. And um, I know you you just mentioned, Bob, that um, um, you, you know you you talked a lot about democracy and representation when um, you know when your commission worked and and you know we had the issue that we were just talking about related to trust and and helping you know changing things. And then also what you said about um, you know, people really want to know that they're heard and, and really, really um, represent it, you know, even more than the outcomes. So I guess my, my, my question is more along the lines of, what do you think? What do you think about what we have ahead of us? I mean, we, have, we were given, as you know, certain assignments to, to certain questions to look at, but I think it's, what do you think about um, give us your your thoughts about what we're about to do. What your your advice, I guess. I think you you should try and determine what is going to accomplish the the goals that you agree on for the city of San Jose. Like I said before, you should think about your criteria first. I I think it makes no sense to first debate the structure of government and then later say everything else, what do you want to add on? Uh, I mean, there are, I mean, it's, to me, it's a perfectly reasonable position for somebody to say, well, I might support the city council having the authority to fire department heads if I knew there were strong equity standards in the charter so that I wouldn't be allowing a department head to be fired because they were advocates for equity. Um, but the only way to be able to have that discussion is be talking about both things at the same time and not having the structural discussion and finish it and then say, okay, th you know, two months later, we'll talk about equity. Right. Um, they both have to be on the agenda at the same time. Now, I'm not saying it's easy to do that, but I think that's the best way that you're going to be able to make the kind of progress that hopefully you'll be able to do. I mean, I know a bunch of you people, you're a good commission. You can make things, you can you know, you can do something that's new and innovative and positive. Uh, not that it will be easy, um, but to do that, you've got to have be in a structure that gives you the framework to be a little free floating and bringing in ideas when they when they can help and not be forced to do it later because of the agenda. Um, so I mean that, and I mean, and you obviously want to get a lot of input. Um, you know, we didn't do that much in terms of outreach and input in the prior uh, commission. For one thing, it was another world in terms of modes of communication. Um, you know, we didn't have all the IT stuff and the social media stuff and all these things that you can use. So it, it was a little different. You have the ca capability, and it was is more of a civic infrastructure now than there was then. So there's a real capability to do serious outreach and communication with different groups in, in San Jose and, and that work should be done. And there are ideas lurking out there. You just have to you know, give them a chance to have a venue to, to speak. Okay, so we're gonna do um, last two questions since we have uh, just two more hands up and then we're going to get back to uh, the rest of our agenda for the evening. Commissioner Matsumura. Uh, we can't hear you. It's the dangers of double mute. Um, <laughs> thank you, Commissioner Fuentes, because that was sort of a perfect um, setup. And I'm 
I'm sorry, Bob, I'm going to kind of push you a little farther down this path of, you know, you've, you've given us the charge to be bold in really carrying on the work, the, the tradition of the district-based elections movement and the work that the 1985 commission did. And, and, you know, both you and Mr. Collins talked about how much farther we need to go um, in terms of <clears throat> real equity and representation. Obviously, we have some, some failures of that in our city. And so I'm, I'm wondering what else you could share with us. You know, you talked about the importance of making sure that we are able to bring up ideas when they help rather than saying, you know, we're going to deal with this now and that later. Um, I think earlier you mentioned outside counsel. You've talked about criteria. You know, I think it's a really difficult task to say we've got this set of problems in the city, you know, be it be it police, be it housing and homelessness, be it, you know, COVID and the number of equity issues. How do we translate that to the charter? It's like a very, very um, obscure political and policy, you know, poli science policy question. So if there's anything else you can advise us in terms of our process so that we don't miss that opportunity to be very aggressive in understanding how the charter is a tool for us not just in the forms of governance sense, right? We don't want to leave anything on the table. If there's other ways that we need to be taking on the charge to increase accountability, representation, and inclusion. Well, I, I mean, I, at this point, I can't solve the problem for you. I think it's one that we will, should all be working on during the next several months. It is, a t it is a tough challenge, and I don't think it's one that's particularly well addressed in other charters, you know? That's why it's the commission enterprise. We're going one step beyond, right? Um, but uh, I'm just uh, two thoughts. One is, uh, and this was, would have to be approached carefully, you can think in the charter about actual equity criteria in terms of outcomes, you know, in terms of does every city council district get its share of parklands? Um, does every city council district get its share of library? resources, um, et cetera. Um, and then another way to look at it uh, in terms of moving towards equity, and would probably be easier, is in terms of process. Um, you can put in the charter sort of some che checks and balances to make sure that equity isn't disregarded. Um, you know, you can require that the city council have uh, uh, a special committee on um, on fairness and equity, and um, that you know, certain kinds of policy proposals have to be rooted in addition to their normal committee through that special committee to get a review to make sure that um, the council knows and the public knows um, what the equity um, you know outcomes are. There's precedent for that in other kinds of areas when. Um, when we developed city council policies, this wasn't through the charter, it was through other mechanisms regarding public subsidies. What we did was have language that required when the city council wants to do a major public subsidy, there's certain kinds of information that has to be provided to the public. You can't just say, it's a good idea, here's $10 million. You gotta be able to jump through certain hoops. You can do the same kinds of things if you're thinking about trying to achieve uh, um, equity outcomes, focusing on process as, as opposed to outcomes. Um, process isn't a, isn't a guarantee, but you know, there's, guarantees are rare. So you try and create models that are most likely to be able to be conducive to the outcomes that you're, you're trying to, to see happen. Last question from Commissioner Diep. Thanks. Um, I, I want to thank uh, Mr. Brownstein. I appreciate your insight earlier on um, what the public needs and, and uh, what they want and, and government's you know, ability to be responsive to that. Uh, I have a two part question for you. One, if I under, if I recall correctly, and I could be wrong on this, I think in addition to being a commissioner member, um, you previously served uh, under a mayor in the city as, as a policy advisor. So you have some experience working under a mayor. Is that right? Did I? 
eight years worth. Yeah. So, so the first part yeah, is under a very great mayor. <laughs> for sure, she isn't here now. Yeah. So under so what frustrations, if if any, and you may not have any, but what frustrations, if any, did you have during that time working from the mayor's side of, of this in the terms of governing in San Jose? And and secondly, um, in, in regards to your comment about government responsiveness to to public demands or wants, um, I feel I feel there's a friction, and, and you may disagree, but I'm going to add that to the premise anyway. I, I feel there's a friction in um, the way our city is right now because you have district uh, council members by district, and of course the council members are um, representative of their districts, of their electorate, and then you have a mayor who is representative of, of the citywide electorate. Um, but I, I don't think the mayor has any uh, authority to do a lot of the things that, uh, let's call them executive orders, uh, and it falls to the city manager. For instance, the city manager called um, the curfew we had last year. It wasn't a council decision or a mayor decision. It was a, a city manager decision. So how do we, where, where is the outlet for responsiveness to the citywide electorate when, the, in my opinion at least, there's, there's no direct outlet because you have a mayor who needs to go and find, what, five other votes um, to, to, to bring about some sort of change. And then once you bring about the policy change, um, there's the bureaucracy because you can pass as many you know, policies as you want, but you need staff to work on it. And you need to prod them or, or somehow there's some sort of accountability that I feel is missing in our system where the bureaucracy department heads can, because of their large workload, um, you know, put something that's been approved on a back burner, let's say, and not really get much done on it. So how would you address that? Well, you had a number of questions in there. Oh, so I apologize. That, no, it's okay. Um, I'll try and, uh, and and deal with some of them, at least in terms of my background working for Susan Hammer. Um, I mean, the first point I want to make is um, a structure can give you the capacity to lead, but you still have to lead. Okay. In other words, Mayor Hammer got things done through that structure that somebody else conceivably would not have gotten done because you have to use that, your, your skills and your energy um, and your ability to build coalitions and mobilize people in order to lead. And if you exercise that political leadership, under my view is under the current structure we have, a mayor can get an enormous amount done. I mean, Susan Hammer passed legislatively a curfew in San Jose. I mean, I was the architect of it. Um, so, I mean, you don't have to wait for city manager. You can develop a, uh, a curfew through ordinance, but you have to lead. And many of the complaints that I've heard about uh, as this debate's been going on regarding changing the government structure where somebody's saying, well, I couldn't do this and I couldn't do that. I hear those and I think that's not a structural problem. That's a leadership problem. How could somebody with a stable governing coalition not manage to make that happen? Um, I mean, I mean, if I told Susan Hammer, she's we got six votes in the city council and I can't figure out how to get a curfew ordinance passed, she'd say, Bob, it's time for you to retire. Uh, you know, you, you need to have the will and skill and ability to um, uh, to, to do those kinds of things. Um, now, in terms of, uh, you know, frustrations, uh, you know, the biggest frustration then, it's, fortunately, we don't have it now, is that it was the conflict between the redevelopment agency and the city, two bureaucracies that hated each other. And, you know, some of, the only time that I remember Susan Hammer actually using off-color language was in meetings between the redevelopment agency and the city, where she was saying, you know, you're, you mean, you're making me deal with this bleep, bleep, bleep. Um, so, um, but I mean, those days are gone. You don't have that institution. The city manager is, during her mayor terms, of sort of the transition of a weaker and weaker city manager was happening. Now, um, now uh, in my mind, a mayor with leadership skills, with a stable governing coalition, ought to be able to get the administration to, to implement any major initiative um, that, um, that they want to have um, take place. And if you're in a situation where there's a genuine emergency, that is, you don't just need it done, you need it done now, um, then I think one option 
is to put in the charter emergency powers where the city council could say, okay, for the next 60 days, we give the mayor more power to deal with this, you know, with the way that the police respond to demonstrations, you know, give the mayor more power to deal with that during the period of the emergency. Doesn't mean you give the mayor power over the planning department, doesn't mean you give the mayor power over libraries. It means you give the mayor a very narrow set of expanded power to deal with the kind of urgent issue that somebody can say, time doesn't allow the normal exercise of leadership to be able to get the job done. And then the last point I'd make is something, uh, an element of frustration. Um, and this is from somebody who's been a community organizer and worked with community groups my whole life is part of the responsibility of people in leadership is to make sure that other people know what the world of the possible is. So it was frustrating to, I've been a major advocate for affordable housing forever, okay? It was frustrating to me to have people come forward and say, here's our affordable housing proposal. We want the redevelopment agency to spend 50% of all the tax or increment that it receives on affordable housing. Now, the problem with that is the redevelopment agency bonded every dollar that came in the door. So if you told them spend 50% of your tax revenues on affordable housing, you're telling them to default on a giant number of bonds. That idea is dead on arrival. So you need to be able to communicate with people so that they can push you, but they can push you towards things that are doable and not things that are impossible. And so that's another, I don't know how the charter fixes that, but that's another burden of leadership that I think is important. That's why you risk that when you ask an old timer like me to reminisce. Well, thank you. That's a great way to, to wrap up uh, our conversation. Really fascinating and, and I think uh, helpful insights. So um, Mr. Brownstein, thank you again. And I hope you continue to, to, to join us and share insights um, you know, via public comment and, and maybe other ways. Chair, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks so much, Bob, for being with us tonight. And thanks to all the commissioners for your thoughtful questions. Really um, helpful to this procedure and process. So, um, and tonight is the one year anniversary of the passing of, of Mayor Hammer. So on International Women's Day, that's a really, she's, a, she's probably one of my favorite people that I would say we honor tonight as well. And her spirit certainly lives on in this kind of work that we're doing. Um, let's move to public comment on this issue before we move back to the work plan speaking. Um, so does anybody in the public want to address the commission on the issue of this study session? Okay, the first speaker is Matt King. Hi, my hand was up from trying to comment before. So it's I, I want to comment on the budget and the engagement discussion earlier. Okay, we're going to come back to that public uh, comment in a second, but this is just about, um, this is just public comment on the study session itself. And then we'll come back to you, Matt King. Okay, so the second speaker would be Alina Yin. I also had a, uh, a comment on the work plan that we, um, and so I guess I'll speak on that later. When is that? Thank you. We'll get there pretty quickly. Thank you though. Is there anyone that wants to speak to give any public comment on the study session before we go back to the work plan? Okay, Matt King. Matt King. You already called him, Tony. Oh, yeah, sorry. I'm waiting, I'm waiting on the work. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Blair Beekman. Hear me? Yes. Great. Hi. Uh, thank you. Blair Beekman here. Um, thank you for this item. Uh, it was nice to hear the words of, uh, of uh, Mr. Brownstein speak about, uh, you know, I, I, really wholeheartedly uh, back where he's coming from. And, you know, he tried to give yourselves options how to uh, address, how you're gonna want to address this issue. And, uh, you know, from where I come from, I'm coming from the ideas there, there's a, a future of, 
of accountability that's possible with the future of technology. And it's a, it's a process, it's a shared process between community and its government. It's not simply government dictating what technology goes into a community anymore. It is a process of sharing and openness and policy making together between community and uh, its government. Exactly what uh, Mr. Bernstein said, you know, Brownstein said that if you, uh, you know, if you simply acknowledge and talk to the everyday public, then you'll get interesting results and, and uh, you know, a certain re good relationship. And, you know, the, the work I'm a part of, it, it, it really embodies the idea of inviting the public to the process. And there's a whole new development happening of, of not just a government by representation anymore and as a republic, but real questions of how the public can be a part of the accountable process and a part of the community process. That's an incredibly exciting notion to conclude really quickly, if I can, uh, you know, the community to invite the community, you know, to the council process is really important. And I hope uh, you can work on that. Thank you. Okay, um, caller ending with 5140. Yeah, I have a hard time uh, wanting to go back to the days of Susan Hammer. You know, her curfew really never worked. She was a, I think she was a terrible mayor. Uh, she had the manger moved from Christmas in the park to where they, the city wasn't even allowed to store it. And she voted in secret with the rest of the city council members on a Saturday when her and I think a majority of them probably should have been at Temple. I hate to say it, but uh, she was anti-Catholic and uh, she was a bigot and she was ugly inside and out. And quite frankly, they should remove her picture from City Hall for what she did. Uh, you know, and Christmas in the Park was completely ruined and it cost the... Uh, Merchants and people didn't want to go down to the down to, to view it because the the manger was missing. It had been there for a long time. And the Lima family mortuary put up uh, a lot of money over the course of the years to maintain that and to build Christmas in the Park. And she totally ruined it. So I wouldn't want somebody like her back uh, in power. And I think Bob uh, is is dating himself. Uh, I you know she she was she was terrible. And, you know, she also made sure that you, the city spent $600,000 for Keys and Codal, which is the ugliest piece of public art I've ever seen in my entire life. The only funny thing is watching the kids climb on top of it and uh, they go, hey, mom, mom, I'm standing on a pile of, well, you know what? And it's, you know, that's the only, you know, redeeming value of that public art. It's all broken now and everything. What a waste of money. That's when the city had a lot of problems. And uh, she spent six hundred thousand dollars, authorized it for that. Like, we need a stronger mayor for this. I, I really don't think so. Sam's got enough power as it is already, and uh, even though it doesn't really show, since the his people from and the next big speaker is Crystal. Hi, so sorry you have to hear things like that but I think I might be somebody you might be interested in listening to. I am someone in the public. I am a senior. I am a person that's been on prescription drugs for uh, chronic lower back pain and depression. I successfully got off of all of my prescription drugs by successfully using medical cannabis, medical marijuana. And you have to get a doctor's recommendation in order to use it. And then you get uh, a county card and then you're able to use it. However, we're paying 35% tax on our cannabis. This is an issue I've been working on for five years. And I have to disagree with Bob a little bit here that the city manager is having decreasing amounts of power. Because he does not like issues related to cannabis, I cannot get my issue passed by city council. I have met with every council member. I have four or five council members in my pocket that are for this, that are writing memos for this. But because the city manager doesn't like cannabis issues, I cannot make any headway. I am 64. I would like to be able to buy my medicine at a dispensary without paying 35% tax on it. I am trying to get the city council members to waive the San Jose 10% business tax that's being applied to patients. These are prescriptions for patients 
with chronically ill diseases and we're paying 35% tax. And again, the city manager is blocking my issue because he doesn't like cannabis. So I have to say, I would vote for the mayor. However, if the mayor doesn't like cannabis issues, I might be in the same place. So either one has too much power. I would like to see less power to whoever wins. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, that was the last public speaker. Thank you. I appreciate um, everybody in the public, their, their thoughts. Uh, let's move back to our discussion around the work plan. Um, and we are, um, I think we answered the questions that folks had. Um, and I'm willing, ready to have the public comments on the work plan. Uh, and then we'll take up possible actions, uh, the adoption and possible actions. So Tony, we at this time can ask the public for comments specifically about the work plan, um, the proposed work plan draft that we received tonight that our consultant reviewed. So members of the public that want to address the issues of, <clears throat> of the work plan, this is your time. Hi, the first speaker is Matt King. Hi, good evening, everybody. Just a couple of comments on, on the work plan and the budget and, and the community engagement. I, I still don't see in, in the work plan any kind of really thoughtful, comprehensive discussion of getting out to community and ensuring that community members of all kinds understand what this commission is and why it matters and what you're doing and why they should be engaged with it. Um, the thought of not having any budget for anything other than paying a consultant to help you run your meetings and uh, do process stuff just doesn't make sense to me. If there's money for the consultant, it seems like there could be money for interpretation and community engagement and whatever else this commission uh, needs to do a really great job. This is a once like a generational activity and I think it should be treated like that in every way including financially uh, so I want to just finally refer you back to the conversation you had several weeks ago with uh of your daughter oh I failed to mention I'm here representing Sacred Heart Community Service so you, you had my boss Poncho here with you and Camille from Somos and they gave you a lot to think about on what should be happening with outreach and I don't I don't see that reflected in what was uh, proposed tonight, except more discussion about the things that are too hard to do or that the city can't afford. So I just really want to push and I want to uh, offer support for the suggestion I heard from, from Commissioner Callender about um, bringing community in and listening to them up front about what they want. Thanks. Thank you. Alina Yin. Hi, thank you. Um, so the 1965 Charter Review Commission was, uh, I'm sorry, the 1965 Charter was penned during the Civil Rights Movement by 15 private local landowners. And I think that it's important that we are aware of such history so that we can continue to build off of the 1985 Commission by being mindful and intentional that we're dismantling systems of oppression and rebuilding with equity and inclusion in mind. <clears throat> We are living in unprecedented historical moment that is opening a possibility for historic change. And I see this commission as the champions of this moment. And I would like to propose two additional measures for study to be added on the work plan. One, it is obvious that from the discussions we've had thus far that the recurring theme of concern is civic participation and community engagement and it needs a redesign a section that does not exist in the city charter right now i would like to build off what blair beekman shared that we can use this opportunity to address this and i would also like to point to the city of detroit um, who started their charter review commission last summer and they unveiled the detroiter bills of rights um, you know what would a san jose civic community engagement bill of rights look like another section that doesn't exist is one on class 
climate strategy. We don't even have a commission on that. And there should be both. Last year, we had a fire season like never before, followed by rolling blackouts. We saw what happened in Texas a few weeks ago. And so I think solidifying and really focusing on these two items would be really great. And also to add to Matt King's comment, you can't say in your commissioner agreements that you value meaningful community engagement and then not prioritize budget for it. It's a contradiction. And I think that it needs to be addressed and we should really focus on what meaningful community engagement looks like and what outreach looks like. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry, I muted because my cat was meowing. Um, Adrian Gonzalez is next. Good evening. My name is Adrian Gonzalez and I'm chair of the city's board of fair campaign and political practices, otherwise known as the city's ethics commission. I'm here today to extend knowledge branch and hopefully open a regular line of communication because our current goals are intertwined. In the mayor's original ballot measure from last summer, not only was the city council proposing to amend the city's governance structure, but they proposed changes to our campaign finance and ethics laws. When the city council decided to step back and create this charter review commission, the campaign finance issues were referred to our board for consideration. In addition, Council Member Jimenez proposed further reform in November, which the Rules Committee decided to take up for consideration and refer to our board. The City Council also clarified at that November Rules Committee meeting that the Charter Review Commission is, is allowed to consider what campaign finance reforms may be integrated into this ongoing Charter Amendment study. However, I've noticed that the current work plan of the Commission uh, is currently lacking specific language in prioritizing campaign finance or ethics uh, reforms. So as the commission moves forward in its work, I invite you all to reach out to myself and the Ethics Commission to establish a regular line of communication so that we can optimize this opportunity to incorporate these vital and important campaign finance issues into this impending charter amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Blair Beekman. All right, thank you, Blair Beekman. Sorry if I sounded a bit uh, overzealous. I'm, I'm sitting outside right now, sorry about that. Um, sorry if I sounded a bit overzealous uh, in my first uh, item maybe. Uh, I, I just can't stress enough that, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Mr. Brownstein brought in a real nice balance of what you're gonna have to consider. But I, I tried to bring in that, you know, there is, and what was mentioned earlier tonight, that uh, of a recent uh, public comment, that you know there is an important future you know of equity of reimagine and uh you know the accountability with technology ideas that you know there's a just an incredible future of 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 the term is uh you know the future of democracy as a, as a socialization process you know and that that's an important concept i mean we we have to continuously consider how democracy is a process of socialization and it, it becomes a more open process through the decades and those are important issues coming up in our next 10 years that has to be explored as you're balancing your other questions. And uh, I, I think it's the community effort and as a part of your work plan that, that should be considered first and foremost. And with, uh, you know, other stronger initiatives thrown in possibly at the end. And uh, if I, I don't know how much time I have left. I don't have my timer, but thank you for your time tonight. And you're, you're talking about history. And that's really important. Thank you. So good luck in uh, your upcoming work. Thank you. Jeffrey Buchanan. Hi, uh, Jeffrey Buchanan on behalf of uh, Working Partnerships USA. I uh, just wanted to voice my support for the, uh, uh, the proposal uh, from Commissioner Callender and uh, Commissioner Matsumura. Um, I think this, this particular commission, certainly we've appreciated all the work commissioners have done so far. But I'm sure as each of you have, have begun to look through the charter and to engage in this work, you can see, you know, what the kind of challenges members of our community would face in trying to figure out how to meaningfully engage in this process. Uh, and so I, I really feel like because this is a, a challenging process to get into, trying to find ways, you know, much like was, uh, was suggested in the, uh, uh, the conversation with uh, uh, our colleagues from Sacred Heart and our colleagues from uh, uh, Somos Mayfair, uh, about what real authentic engagement looks like with community leaders who who are working on this kind of civic engagement on a regular basis. Uh, and I think to do that, 
uh, effectively, which we've seen policymaking efforts within the city of San Jose uh, use those kinds of partnerships effectively to get uh, more detailed uh, engagement. I think a, a really great example of that, uh, the city's work around its uh, anti-displacement strategy recently, where there was a real strong investment uh, in those community partnerships and really getting uh, getting into creating the space of engaging folks that are directly impacted, uh, but doing so through both providing education and opportunity for input. Uh, I think this is a this is a perfect example of, of where that kind of deeper uh, uh, engagement could really be a benefit to a process where we know at the end of all this, there's going to be a tremendous amount of community interest in what this commission comes up with. Uh, last summer, we saw hundreds of people calling into city council meetings to discuss, you know, what was that that failed strong mayor proposal. And so I think at the end of this process, people are going to be paying a lot of attention. So hopefully we can find ways to make sure we've invested along the way uh, so that people have. Thank you. Justin Lardenois. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, just briefly, I wanted to call attention to the comment earlier that had some really anti-Semitic insinuations. That's just not okay. And if you're still on the line, don't ever do that again. Thank you. Thank you. That was the final speaker. Thank you, and thanks to members of the public for their engagement and their um, comments. We appreciate them all. Um, I'm gonna come back to the commission now, and I'm gonna ask for a motion because then we can have a discussion. And so is there someone who would like to put a motion on the table around the adoption of the work plan with fill in the blank? We've got Commissioner Callender with his hand raised. Um, Commissioner Callender. Yeah, I'm actually looking at two different motions because after listening to um, our speakers, I, I think there's two separate issues. But one issue I think is, is very clear is that we need funding for outside counsel, as was mentioned multiple times by Mr. Brownstein. Um, I, I do believe after listening to him, I think we could definitely deal with additional researchers for analysis and qualitative analysis and including understanding what the impact may be. So I'm not sure if that can, if that should be included, but, but here's what I'm going to move, Mr. Ferrer, um, versus having it come back next round. I'd like to move that re request from council adequate funding for one, outside council, two, research for analysis, uh, for analysis and, and qualitative analysis, and three, to uh, funding to bring on board up to 10 grassroots organizations to assist with outreach. That's my motion. Thank you, can I get a second? Second. I second. Second. Okay, I'm gonna take Vice, Vice Chair Johnson's second since a so few of you are excited about it. Um, we'll, uh, we'll now move into discussion. Anybody want us to have a discussion about the motion itself, which is the adoption of the work plan with the addition of coming back at our next meeting with a budget proposal for the funding of outside counseling, research for quality of analysis, and the funding of civic engagement with 10 grassroots organizations. Uh, Commissioner Bruce. Great, thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, you know, just from, you know, our conversations we've had over the past few meetings and hearing from our speakers today, uh, you know, the decisions and uh, that we make and that we recommend to the council will impact our communities for decades to come. And uh, we really don't want to drop the ball uh, when it comes to making sure that all voices are heard and that we're bringing everyone to the table when soliciting their feedback for this process. Uh, I am a big fan of, especially with uh, the last part of Commissioner Callender's uh, motion to include the 10 grassroots organizations. Uh, I was wanted to propose something similar. I know um, the SAG, the Station Area Advisory Group and the city's uh, mobility plan task force had uh, grants from the city uh, into community-based organizations to do outreach. 
Uh, and, you know, I think, you know, like we've heard from some members of the, the, the public and, uh, you know, some of the big issues, anti-displacement and other important housing issues uh, where, you know, community input was critical. Uh, so I am very enthusiastic. Uh, uh, I enthusiastically support this motion. I'll be supporting it when the vote comes and I want to thank Commissioner Callender for bringing it forward. Okay, we have Commissioners Matsumura, Amador, Calendar, Fuentes, Tran. Commissioner Matsumura. Thank you. Um, at this point, I, I just have a question. I am supportive of the motion is framed, but wanted to clarify, I think there's been a number of um, dimensions of the work plan that, that in our earlier discussion, we've raised and, and that were, I think, implicated by uh, what Mr. Collins and Mr. Brownstein shared. And so I just wanted to clarify, uh, I'm supportive of the motion to, to request this funding. I think there's, and Commissioner Callender had mentioned a couple of motions potentially. So, so are we voting just on that or does that uh, include adoption of the work plan? Because I think there's more to discuss on the work plan. It would include the ad adoption of the work plan with this addendum. If there's a, any friendly amendments that folks want to make to the addition of um, Commissioner Calendars, I'll recognize that. But at this point, we're discussing the work plan and the proposal, the budget proposal, to come back to you on those items that were elicited. If there's other tweaks to the work plan in terms of once we get a budget proposal, obviously, if we get funding, that would enhance the work plan tremendously. So we would be doing that again as another place of um, the additional work that um, could be happening. That would be the addition to the work plan. So kind of as the structure it is now, plus this additional um, movement will move us forward. Okay. Uh, With that sure. answer to the question, I, I, I'd like to hear from, from my colleagues, but um, but I think potentially I, we should be co constructing a friendly amendment so that we can um, encompass the totality of, of, as you said, any tweaks we want to make to the work plan. And appreciate that. Let's hear from everyone and then definitely we, I'll open it up for any other friendly amendments that you want to make. Uh, Commissioner Amador. Yes, this is Veronica Amador. And I also would like to add something to it, um, which is the racial equity toolkit. And this is done by the Government Alliance on Race and Equity. Um, I think they already have something that can't support us in our civic engagement. And when we're actually looking at the equity form of engaging a civic engagement and how different um, tactics or whatever we move forward will impact our communities and not just our communities, but as well as city employees. So um, I definitely want to, uh, if that needs to be an amendment as well to look at or even to partner with, because I know that we have a racial equity um, that was formed last year and how can we partner with them as well to be here with us? Thank you. And Commissioner Hamador, I'm happy to reach out to the office to make sure that we incorporate their work and kind of reach out to them as part of the work plan. Um, we definitely can. And after we've heard tonight, um, I'm happy to do that. And I'll take that as a friendly direction from the commission. We don't necessarily have to have it in the, in the vote itself, because I do think that kind of any additional speakers, any additional kind of resources, um, we're definitely open to. You saw a lot of the TB determined. So uh, those kinds of suggestions we're happy to take on just themselves. Uh, back to Commissioner Callender. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, um, after I heard this was an all encompassing motion, that, that's why I said I wanted to break it down in two. But what I'd like to do is um, uh, move to amend my motion to include that we, um, on the March 22nd meeting, we opened it up. Uh, to the community to hear from the community on what things they'd like to change. I think hearing from Mr. Brownstein um, and Mr. Collins tonight shows us that just the, the four things that are there, there's many more things that we should be listening to and we should understand all those things up front so that we can plan ahead versus jamming ourselves uh, in the end as I talked about earlier. So I'd like to amend my emotion to include that and then hopefully if there's other thoughts that folks have, they can amend the motion further. So I will look to you, Mr. Chairman, how you want to handle that amendment, that request. That's fine. I'm going to accept the amendment and ask that the second 
which is Vice Chair Johnson, if you'll accept that amendment, that friendly amendment. Yes, I'll accept it. Thank you. So therefore the motion will now be that um, that's the adoption of the work plan with the additional uh, funding request coming back to you next week uh, and the addition that the March 22nd meeting uh, be redesigned to include public comment um, in a more formal way in terms of making sure that public has outreach at the March 22nd piece, which uh, to move it up from a later kind of notion in terms of the uh, items that need to be included. Okay, uh, Commissioner uh, Fuentes. You're, You're muted. muted, Maria. Okay, I'm sorry, Maria Fuentes. Um, Let's see, I'm having problem with the, uh, with the idea of adopting the work plan right now. And um, the reason is, um, I think we heard some very important, insightful um, presentations today, as well as the types of questions that came out in our discussion that I, I really would like to have a session um, similar to what we had in the very beginning, um, uh, Chair, Chairman Ferrer, where we really took time to listen to each of us to kind of debrief and express really what are we thinking right now. And um, I, I, I would not be, I mean, I, I support the intention and in a lot of the things, especially the, the three items that, um, that um, uh, Rick has put on on this motion, but I I would have a hard time voting yes on this work plan because I feel that it really is not capturing enough of the essence of the work that we know already today. See, we already, I, I mean, I think, um, maybe I'll just speak for myself. I think already I know that we need to look deeper into, into what we're gonna be doing uh, beyond what, um, what's in, in black and white given to us in, in, um, as far as our responsibilities. And my fear is that we adopt a work plan that hasn't been fully, well, put it this way, fully vet vetted um, with ourselves to see, are we really um, thinking that what we have right now is our true charge and is our true work plan? or are we already expanding it? And I would love to be able to hear from everyone on, on that question. You know, where are we today right now? And I know tonight, maybe it's not the good time. Um, and I would support a motion that, that says, we're gonna do this tonight, but next month, I mean, next, next time we meet, we're really gonna do Ron Robin and discuss the, um, the um, list of items we have here and do we want to change that? Because for instance, I just wanna say um, on the question of equity, on the question of how our community feels and what they need from government right now, um, I think there's a lot to be considered. And I think that's one of the areas that I know we need to interject more into what we're looking at. Thank you, Commissioner Fuentes. And I just want to take a, a, the, the chair's pleasure here to be able to describe, I think what we're going to need is if we have additional resources, I'd like to have the discussion in the round robin after we know about these additional resources, because we can continue to have this conversation about what we'd like to do. But if we have the current resource, resources to do that, I think we're going to be short. So we've developed a work plan of what we have with the resources we have. If your motion passes and we adopt uh, and we get additional budget, additional resources, then it has a major implication on how the work plan would read. So I would definitely bring it back when we have the budget um, items that you've, um, that have been put into the motion. And then we'll have a bigger discussion around, okay, here are the resources. Now, what does that look like in terms of the plan? So. I appreciate your, your comment, but I do expect to bring it back, um, but with the additional information on additional resources um, as well. Let's continue. 
Can I can I just um, respond? Um, sure. I think that um, as an example, thinking more with the lens of equity. Okay. In other words, that let's just say that we all agree that in our city at this time, we need to view what we're doing with the lens of equity. And maybe just let's say racial equity as an example. So that that's not something that we need more money for. That is something that we need more thought to and we need to consider more. And we have to ask the community about that when we have our any public hearing. So in other words, it's a concept that we add, um, not necessarily an overlay to everything we do, but as an essence to what we do. So I don't think that costs more money. It's just a question of do does the entire group want to add that? I mean. Thank you, appreciate your, your clarity. Next commissioner. Uh, Next commissioner is Commissioner Tran. Thank you, uh, Hui Tran. Uh, I have uh, some clarifying questions and some follow-up comments, but the motion as it is on the table, uh, it's to request for more funding and it also sets the direction for how that additional funding would be spent if received, right? Okay, um, well, I, I definitely support that. Um, one of the thoughts that I had in terms of funding is that I don't know what the budget process is, and then maybe Tony can help clarify this, but um, if we make this request now, how likely is it that we are able to get a commitment in the next two weeks? I, I should have changed my background. I'll give myself two minutes. Um, unlikely in the next two weeks. What happens when you make a, a this will go to the rules committee um, under public record as correspondence from commissions. And then from there, they can direct it to go to council. It won't be two weeks. Okay. This, um, this will go on for the for next week's rules, not this Wednesday, because that agenda is already published. We can. Well, I don't even know if I can. I, I need. I need to push to get it done by Thursday to get it onto the rules for next week. But in two weeks, it wouldn't. It's too short. Okay. Um, I ask that just to clarify, because if there's a way for us, maybe, uh, I don't know if this helps at all in terms of the motion, um, but if we can tap into alternative funding sources, uh, I, you know, each of the council members has discretionary funds, and I'm sure it's been impacted by COVID-19, but if this is a commitment from the council to ensure that this process is transparent and engages the community, we can reach out to the individual council members to ask them to devote a portion of the discretionary funds to support this um, you know, it's just an idea, but uh, if we can get that, if we if we get clarity on how we want to spend the money, we can then go to each of the individual council members uh, and ask them to commit some funding to this process. Thank you. Next commissioner. Uh, commissioner Brosio. Perfect, thank you. Uh, Luis Barrosio. Um, I have a couple comments. One is uh, I, I'm following what several commissioners have, have been talking about. Um, uh, Commissioner Amador, Commissioner Fuentes, um, it falls in line with, with, uh, with the tried and true recommendations of Mr. Brownstein in terms of um, ensuring that we don't isolate our discussions, um, especially when it comes to structure and leaving some elements off the table, right? Until we get to it on the calendar. Um, I think integrating questions about economic impact, equity, um, uh, community engagement, all of that seems to be part, should be part of every discussion, every meeting. Um, and how we, how we do that on the work plan, I think um, is just, is just uh, in the details, right? But it definitely needs to be an intentional um, inclusion that we do that, right? Um, in any, in any, um, the part of our uh, conversations, I think those are those are some critical elements to include. Um, and with that, uh, going back to my recommendation um, or my thinking about how we can adjust and maximize our time together by not skipping, um, you know, from one month to month, uh, like one month to one month because because of a holiday. Um, 
But as I look at the calendar, we're not going to see that until May, right, with, with Memorial Day. So there'll be discussion about that. So um, I appreciate the chair's uh, uh, comments early on that whatever we vote on today, um, it's a living document. So in terms of that, um, uh, I'll hold off on, on making any, any recommendations. But um, a suggestion at this point is to please look forward um, in the off meetings. Um, between civic works and and the chair, if you can, uh, if you can look into May and the summer months, how how we can stagger um, and maximize those times um, that uh, will be missing, right? So how do we how do we get them back on the calendar? Um, and lastly, um, following up on on something that uh, early on uh, in the first agenda. Um, from Tony, there was inclusion of all the memos from, from our city council members. And I did track the string of conversation about campaign reform and uh, the discussion about uh, lobbyists. And um, I know that uh, council member Carrasco and Esparza, uh, our mayor and council member Arenas um, did touch on it. But um, in looking at one of the memos, um, it did say that, um, let me see, quote, uh, campaign uh, finance reforms and further restrictions on lobbyists involvement in government. Uh, none of these changes require a charter amendment and can be adopted by a simple majority vote. So I kind of didn't bring it up anymore um, because I felt that among the council members, they, they must have seen that, hey, like this is something that we can do, right? That we don't need a um, have, the, have the commission uh, take that on. But for a point of clarification, I know that um, in public comments, there was, there was something uh, like mentioned that we do have a hand in that. So I don't want um, that to be a missed opportunity if that is within our purview and, it not, uh, and it's not something um, that, 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 that we can pass the buck on. Um, so just, the clarification, is that something that we should include to, to talk about? Just because I know in the summer months, this was also part of the conversation. Um, and it was in a couple of memos that, that, um, that were part of the development of this commission. So just clarity, um, was, that, was that something that um, we should revisit, include, or is that something that uh, unfortunately the member of the community was misinformed and that is already being taken care of? Even though we should be partnering up, I love the spirit of that, but in terms of the technical work, is that something that we should re-include or is that something that we, um, it's already been taken care of and the commission doesn't necessarily have to work on that? Thank you. And Commissioner Bosio, I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna respond to two points that you made. Um, to your last point, I think that is something that I would direct staff to investigate in terms of the ethics committee's work and to understand is the ethics commission looking at that specifically, how that might impact our discussion of election year and when folks are elected. Does that, does that come into that same discussion and be needed to be included? So I'd ask for staff to clarify that and come back to us with that just from a clarity perspective and doing a little research on what the other commission is doing. Um, to your second point, though, around the calendar, I'll definitely take a look at that. One of the things that is helpful is not having a meeting in order for staff and the consultant and myself to get some work done. And so it does help us. This month really helped us to get the survey completed, to get the analysis done, to adapt, you know, to redo the work, uh, work plan and get our guests invited and queued up, as well as posting last week to the, the agenda online. So it does give us a little bit more room. I know the, the rhythm of the commission itself is challenging, but I do, I do appreciate that the break in time sometimes really can help us to get things done as well. So, uh, but we'll definitely look at the calendar itself to make sure that we're taking full advantage of the time we have. And we also run into the staffing challenges around the other commissions that are also working um, so that's some of the reasons kind of behind that. Next commissioner's comments. Uh, commissioner Johnson, uh, Vice, Vice Chair Johnson, excuse me. Oh, um, it was the same as what Commissioner Barosley was saying about the campaign finance reform, because I did ask 
to integrate that into the work plan. I didn't see that. So I just wanted some clarity around why that wasn't there. Uh, great. Commissioner Diep. Yeah, hi. Um, I I was kind of listening through the discussion and, and um, hearing the, the motion as articulated. I, I find myself unable to support it, um, ma mainly because the the funding issue, I mean, having sat through a lot of the budget issues with the city council, I know that it's unlikely that they'll come from the budget and we're probably going to have to do a lot of cuts this year anyway. Uh, but just from a, a matter of making the ask, um, this this commission was was formed on, you know, uh, three very narrow questions uh, because th these are weighty issues and the council could look at it themselves, but they have a bunch of other things to do. So they assembled 23 of us to, uh, you know, spend six hours a month of hours to debate and, and dig into it and, and write whatever our recommendation will be. Um, and I feel that uh, we're, we're kind of um, a bit of mission creep, or maybe that's not the right word, but we're kind of expanding the scope of why we were formed uh, to go and, and request funding to simply go to the public and say, well, what would you like us to do? What would you like us to cover? What would you like us to explore? Um, I was, during the first meeting, I was one of the people to, to even say, uh, we should look at everything. We should look at other chapters of the charter beyond the three things. Uh, but that's more of a, like an academic reading, looking and making recommendations to um, the council, what we feel could use a touch up or, or recommendations about whatever we feel we should recommend. Um, but but requesting money to turn this endeavor into a, uh, you know, um, an opening to kind of revamp the charter is, I think, beyond what I'm prepared to do. Uh, so um, that's just me. Thanks. Thank you. Next commissioner, uh, Commissioner Fuentes. Um, wait, wait. She she spoke already on this. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. Come. All right. So uh, we'll, we'll keep going then. Uh, commissioner uh, Meitsky. And you're on mute. Yes, um, thank you. Uh, Mr. Brownstein talked about we really need to have a free ranging. He recommended we have a free ranging discussion around all these issues at one time, you know, th throughout this process. As I look at the work plan, it's very linear, where we talk about one issue, resolve it, talk about a next issue. So it really doesn't take that into account. And I, I guess I would suggest uh, at a minimum, after public hearing number three, we really add time where we sit down and look at all the things that were the whole scope that we're looking at, because you know, there is an interplay between each of these issues and, and have the ability to have that discussion, you know, once we hear all the information. Thank you. And Commissioner Matsumura. Thank you. Um, so I, I wanna make sure that we're, we're clear on the intent of the second portion of Commissioner Callender's motion and what the implications of it are for, for the work plan and how we proceed. Um, and so I'm gonna state what I, I think that is um, and, and hear back from the maker of the motion and the seconder, you know, whether that is in, the, in fact the intent or whether there's a friendly amendment needed there. So I think we are hearing from the community on March 22nd about what are the, the issues of concern to members of the public um, that we as the commission need to be undertaking um, sort of that full scope I think it was the elephant right like what are the parts of the elephant uh, that we need to understand as Commissioner Callender spoke about earlier and then I believe what that means is that we are going to need on March 22nd I can see potentially that that discussion would need to spill over into April 5th to look at the work plan and see what implications there are for the work plan um, of the input that we have received so that we can, as Mr. Brownstein was recommending to us, make sure that we are not being too linear as Commissioner Maitsey was, was speaking about, but do we need to move certain topics up? Do we need to you know, build in this time to talk about additional measures? I think hopefully that's also gonna be a good time for us to lay out some of those specific research questions and criteria so that we're being sort of very thoughtful about putting our topics in order so that they can build on each other and that we have the criteria, conduct research about how the criteria apply, learn about that research, et cetera. So 
that's obviously way too long for a motion, but I did want to clarify that essentially the intention is to use March 22nd, potentially April 5th, to make sure that we have that fluidity and in, in sort of interactions that we need in the work plan. Um, and that I would assume that that means that it is possible we we will not be concluding on September 20th, but but may need additional time up to, of course, what's possible within the scope of our council direction. Mr. Chairman, if I could respond, that was a very eloquent rendition of what I said uh, to accomplish the goals of what my motion was intended to do. So correct. I'm not surprised, Commissioner Callender. That was she's good. Um, next, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Percival. Great, thank you. Uh, just a, a couple of things. Um, one, uh, we've heard uh, both from the public and other commissioners reference uh, campaign finance. Um, I think it would be nearly impossible for this commission to do that kind of work without some council support. This is a hugely complicated issue. Uh, having taught it in my courses and studied it some that uh, we are uh, dealing with local, state, federal legal issues. Um, I, I would, you know, a, as a commission, a particular doing this over Zoom uh, to uh, take on those issues at the same time, these other ones, which I think will take up more time than we actually think, um, at least as it's laid out on the work plan, um, I find it really hard to conceive that this commission would be able to take on those in, a, in, a, in an effective way um, while also bringing in public comment without some additional support. And I, I felt like sort of the commission would be set up for failure uh, if we were being asked to do that without additional resources. Um, and I'll just kind of follow up on, on Maria's comment earlier. I really do feel like we need a, before I personally could, I think, vote in favor of the work plan, have a, a clear sense of some of the things that uh, both Bob and John were talking about earlier in some terms of criteria, equity, for example, affects things like the elections and how we elect people. Uh, so there's so much uh, sort of cross pollination and interconnected to this. I think we as a commission would benefit from hearing a, a more free ranging discussion among its members as we're just getting to, to know each other. So thank you. And uh, Commissioner Lozak. I had a question about the um, the 10 NGOs we're going to be working with. Uh, how are they going to be chosen? Is it going to be one for each council district? Is it the usual suspects? Um, what, what did the, the maker of the motion have in mind? Uh, if I could to the chair, I didn't have to set up to 10 so that uh, so that the staff could uh, identify who they are, hopefully in concert with the, the leadership here. Okay. Well, I, I hope that we don't go to the usual suspects, that we find the most um, important organization that is actually dealing with um, uh, some of the issues that we're going to be tackling, including accountability and inclusion, um, and uh, that some thought be given to, to having um, an organization from each council district. Um, to, uh, to address some of these things. I, I'm just throwing that, that out there. I also have a concern that, that there's a whole lot of mission creep that I'm hearing tonight that really concerns me. Um, uh, you know, campaign finance reform. I mean, we have, a, we have the, the gentleman who talked uh, from the commission, uh, the ethics commission, that, that should be looking into this, not this body. Um, and just some of the other, some of the other issues. I'm, I'm having a real, Real problems with mission creep. I, I, I think I agree with Mr. Percival that, you know, we have a lot of work to do um, with just what we've been charged to do. And I think that we need to do that. I don't disagree that we shouldn't um, integrate accountability and inclusion and some of those other things into the direction. But um, it isn't just about, you know, whether it's a mayor manager or a manager led. There's also the issue of the that we were asked about the election and you know it's a simple question you know should should the mayor get six years or or, or when, when when should the uh, the changeover take place so uh, you know I, I i hope that we can stay focused on what our what our charge is i've said this before 
um, if we start going way afield, and, and even John said it, you know, that if we come forward with something that the council isn't going to support or the public isn't going to support, then it, it we're wasting our time. Uh, the the uh, the charge we were given was sort of a compromise among all of the varying factions of the uh, of the council about what they wanted to have us look at, and then the, the hodgepodge at the end was to to make sure that we we looked at some of the issues that are facing um, us in this particular moment in time that we're in uh, with regard to accountability and inclusion. So um, I just wanted to share my concern that there's a lot of mission creep and, and, and I, I'm concerned that we're not going to get finished with the job that we've been asked to do and we're going to come forward with things that we weren't asked to look at. Thank you. All right, well, uh, Commissioner Lazat was our last uh, commissioner um, with a, a new hand raised. So I'll, I'll turn it back to you, Chair. Thank you so much. Um, thanks for all your comments. I guess I wanna ask um, for a little bit of, um, I, I'm, I'm in some ways um, sharing Commissioner Lazat's um, concern around not so much mission creep, but just a matter of we are in a, a timeline to get our recommendations through our two plans done and, and to council. So we don't have unlimited time, nor do we have unlimited resources. So I wanna keep us focused on the charges that we have kind of in front of us. I don't want that to in any way be limited to the lenses in which we look at them. So the questions that we're asking in the kind of the first four things and then the, the, the hodgepodge as Commissioner Lazat said, the, those first ones are very specific questions that I think we need to address in a, in a timely fashion for the report. I don't think that any of those, the issues of equity or inclusion, diversity, those are not lenses that we have that the, in any way are limited to take on. The economic issue I think is also one that we should look at. So looking at these questions in a hard way, um, I'm completely um, hoping that we look at all these questions with these lenses. I'm hearing very strongly from the commission that you want to make sure that we have integrated conversations so that um, we're not having a conversation only about one thing. I'm hoping that you read the work plan as a plan, not as a dictate in any way. So questions and comments and thoughts and changes as we continue to have um, speakers and as we continue to have our study sessions, I mean, the work plan should change every week, I would assume because we're always gonna be learning new things and, and be in, engaged in this conversation in an active way. So I'm gonna ask for the vote on the- Wait, um, Excuse me, I have my hand up and I would like to add an, a friendly amendment. Okay, I will get there in a second, Commissioner. Before we vote. Yeah, I'll get there in a second. Okay, um, so so what I'm, I'm asking is that we look at this work plan, um, look at the motion tonight as this work plan being um, as of now, so that we keep moving and developing it, um, but it will never be done. And so there never will be a time when we're gonna be able to say, oh, now the work plan's done. So I wanna make sure that folks understand we will continue to amend and change and open it up and, and look at it. We also can look at the calendar. Um, I've also heard in terms of more discussion in the round table in terms of, okay, so what do you all think now? Um, and we're certainly able to, as we build the agendas, we're certainly able to do that as well. There's one issue that was not brought up that I wanted to circle back on in terms of the question I have on the budget resources. Translation was not brought up. And I'm wondering if that was just an omission by Commissioner Gallander around um, resources, additional resources since that has been brought up so many times by different commissioners. Uh, that was actually just a mistaken omission that should actually be included with the motion as we've talked about the need for that. And obviously we don't have a budget. And does the seconder of the motion accept that? Thank you. Okay, so um, Commissioner Fuentes. Okay, thank you. So um, I would like to uh, make a recommendation to the um, maker in the second of the motion, if they would include a friendly amendment that states that we will look, um, we will look at, at all our work. Um, and let me just give you a quick example. Like for instance, just looking at 
March 22nd, what we will be doing, okay? And we all have the, the, um, the work plan. But that, every, that we will look at everything we do with the lens of equi economic and racial equity and strong, represent, strong representative government. And so the idea is that as we do this work, I mean, um, Chair, with respect to you, um, we already today have new ideas, new input that is informing the work plan. And, and so this is an example of um, where I'm making this, um, offering this friendly amendment um, that again, that we um, include, that we look at everything, all our, you know, within our work plan, nothing, not adding a separate item, but look at everything with an economic and equity lens as well, I'm sorry, economic and racial equity lens and the lens of strong representative government governance. Mr. Chairman, if, if I can respond, I believe my motion was in regards to the request for budget for the specific purposes uh, for outreach, et cetera. And then the other one was ensure that we're getting the information uh, from the public in a timely fashion so that we immediately start. I'm not sure, I, I hear what Mr. Freya Quintus is saying, Commissioner Freya is saying, I, but that may be a separate motion. I, I'm not sure that it ties into my motion. So I'll look to you, Mr. Chairman, if you believe there's a tie, but I believe it may be a second motion. It's a motion that I would definitely support, but. I thought, I thought your motion included adopting the work plan. I'm sorry. Oh, the, the, oh, it does include adopting the work plan, but I think it should probably be made after this motion, after we pass this motion. Okay. So, but I look to the chair to make the ruling. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, agree with Commissioner Calendar and, and ask that Commissioner Fuentes that if you have that motion, I'll accept it after we take a vote on this first one. And we do have a, a hand from Commissioner Matsumura. Very briefly. Um, I do want to make sure that we get a copy of the civic makers contract just so that we, you know, understand that that scope as we also talk about what other resources we need. We know we don't want to duplicate between those resources and what's in the contract. We also don't want to leave gaps between the two. And I don't know if that needs to be included in the motion or can simply be a request. Okay, then, then it's a request. It's a request that we can do. That's not a problem. Okay. You ready for the question? Okay, so the motion on the floor is to adopt the work plan as it is of today. Again, with the understanding that we'll continue to uh, uh, change it as we move forward um, with a request to come back with funding, a funding request for outside counsel, research for qualitative analysis, um, for funding for up to 10 grassroots organizations and for additional translation services. In addition, the, um, the public comment be moved up um, to the, looking at the March 22nd meeting um, and that we integrate the issues um, in, uh, along the way in terms of all of our conversations and not wait till the end, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, and if we're ready for the question, I'd ask the clerk to call the roll. Barbara? Barbara? Yes. Christina? Yes. Dan? Dan? I think it looks like he's gone. I'll come back when I get through everybody. Elizabeth? Yes. Ellie? Yes. Enrico? Yes. Frank? Yes. Eric? Yes. George? Yes. We? We, right? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Jeremy? Yes. Jose? Yes. Lund? Lund, yep. Linda? Linda? Uh, given my prior comments, no. Louis, um, Luis? 
Yes. Magnolia? Oh, she's absent. Maria? Yes. Sammy? No. Sherry? Yes. T. Tran? No. Veronica? Yes. Yang Zhao? No. Um, Dan and Lun. Lun Diep. Uh, nay. Thank you. We have 16 yes, four no. Actually, I can't count the no's because my calculation is wrong. But we have 16 yeses, so it passes. Thank you. Um, I'm going to um, ask Commissioner Fuentes if he wanted to make a motion. So, um, okay, so my motion is that um, that as we work through this work plan, that um, we look at everything at every step along the way through a an economic and racial equity lens, and that we look at how how our work, um, is going to impact uh, maintaining and improving strong representative government. Okay, is there a second? Okay, hearing none, the motion. Second. Oh, we do have a second for discussion. Yes. Okay. There's been a motion and a um, second. Is there a discussion? You know, um, I would again like to explain that, um, Hang on. Um, especially after hearing the, the significance and importance of our work in the long term of the city, um, looking at our work plan without considering these critical issues that we're living today, um, it, it, it would have something major lacking. It, it would have a, it would be lacking the essence of, of what we need to do for our city um, because these issues are so important. And, um, and again, as, as has been mentioned more than once, not just for me, is if we don't bring this up now and start looking at it today, then when will we do that? Okay. And um, I look at the work plan and I look at the items and I think, what are these things aren't brought into, into our thoughts and in our discussions? Um, are we really doing our, our, our duty? Are we really serving our community? So, okay, I'm gonna move to discussion. Uh, Commissioner Lazat, do you have your hand raised? I do. Um, I'll have a friendly amendment. Given that this is National Women's uh, Month, I'd like to add uh, gender to the uh, economic and racial lens. Yes, I accept it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. And the second? Commissioner Callender? Absolutely. Okay. Commissioner Amador. Yes, and I would also like to add um, another amendment where we are partnering up with the uh, representative from the Office of Racial Equity. This was, a, I know it's a new program that the city put out, but I know that they've been, I was, um, I was really, I had the, um, a couple of years ago, being able to work with the Government Alliance on Race and Equity, um, which is called GAIR. Um, and I know that the this new office has been working alongside as well as with the county on this. So um, they would really bring a lot of perspective into the work that we're doing, especially when it comes to racial equity and looking at it through that government lens as well. So um, if... Okay, so the friendly amendment is to um, additionally work with the Office of... Uh, racial equity, maker of the motion? Yes, accept it. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Commissioner Marshman. Uh, it, I have mission creep is my concern. And it's not that these things aren't all important to weave in. And I don't know if I'm going to, I'll probably support the motion, but 
it's uh, it's really a concern for me that we're that we're trying, going to perhaps try to do too much to meet a deadline of next fall to finish this up. And I think we need at some point to um, uh, to take stock of that because I don't see. I mean, we're March now, and we don't have a work plan that we've really you know agreed on. Um, I you know I hope people can think about about focusing a little more. Thank you, Commissioner Tran. Thank you, uh, Hui Tran. Um, I take this motion and the last as a statement of principles or a statement of, of you know, wants, right? Um, and which is why I'm in support, right? I mean, uh, the reason why, and I'm gonna be supporting in support of this, uh, but to be clear, I don't think we have any authority to, for example, require or demand the city council to grant us additional budget. We don't have the power to compel people to view through view this through an equity lens, but I do take these motions as statements of, of of values, statements of priorities, and so I support this. Thank you. Any other comments, uh, Commissioner Brosio? I'm sorry, Commissioner Brosio. Yes, perfect. Thank you, uh, Luis Barrosio. Um, Two things. One is I hear I hear uh, mission creep. Uh, if I'm saying that right, um, I need I need some definition on that. I'm not I'm not up to date on that uh, on that on that term. Um, and then two, um, I will be I will be uh, supporting this motion. I think I think it falls in line with with the fifth task, right? Consider additional men, uh, consider additional measures and potential charter amendments as needed. That will improve accountability, representation, and inclusion. Um, so I think it's right in our task. Um, we're just we're just taking five and ensuring that one through four are in are in line with number five. Um, and along with looking more broadly um, as number five pushes us to. But I think but I think number five covers um, the spirit of this of this of this. Um, uh, of this motion. So thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Matsumura. Thank you. Um, I will be supporting the motion uh, sort of as Commissioner Hui Tran um, stated. And I, thank you for being so good about remembering to say your name at the beginning of your comments. Ellen Matsumura, I'll try to work on that. Um, I, I do though also want to respond and say, I think statements of, of principle, the function of statements of principle um, are to, as a commission to statements of principle in the previous motion or as a commission to dictate how we do the work together. Ultimately, the scope of our power is to make recommendations to the council, but in order to do that, we have quite a process ahead of us um, to, to do the best possible job. And so I don't want to, I guess, I don't want to understate um, the scope of that power um but because you know we we are responsible for the work plan we are responsible for um giving giving uh direction as i understand it um to the staff that we have supporting us and thank you to lawrence for that and to the chair for the role that he's playing in that um and and i just want us to to be aware of that that scope and responsibility that we have um to to carry out this process to maximum effect. Okay, I see no other hands. Um, I'm gonna ask the maker of the motion, would you see this as being um, written into our commissioner agreements under we value diversity, the additional language that you're suggesting tonight, would you see that as where we should make sure we put this? It obviously gets into our work, but to, um, to operationalize it into our agreements if this motion passes? Um, well, maybe we, we need to um, to ask the recorder to reread the motion, but I intended it to be part of the work plan, not okay. of the- Thank you. That's my, just my clarity. All right. Thank you. All well, right. Thank you, Louise, for, for your statement. If there any, um, I see no other hands, and so I'm going to move to the question. Um, all those in favor, uh, if uh, the clerk will take the roll. Barbara? Yes. Christina? Yes. Elizabeth? 
Yes. Ellie? Yes. Enrico? Aye. Frank? Yes. Eric? Aye. George? Yes. Hui? Hui Tran? Yes. yes. Jeremy? Aye. Jeremy? Thank you. Jose? Yes. Lundip? Aye. Linda? Yes. Luis? That is a yes. Magnolia? I keep calling her and she's absent. Sorry. Maria? Yes. Tammy? Yes. Terry? Yes. T. Tran? Yes. Veronica? Yes. Ang Zhao? Yes. And that motion passes. And now we'll have our final public comment, Tony. The first um, hand raised is caller ending in 5140. 5140. Okay, moving on to Blair Beekman. Blair? Blair is unmuted. I'm not hearing him. I'm not sure if it's my computer. Can anybody else hear him? Okay. No. Okay, so... Um, let me go back to 5140. And I'll go back to Blair. And if, if they don't speak, then I would say that we're both done. Okay, Blair. Okay, so I think we're, we're done with public speakers. Thank you, and thank you all for being here tonight and for your thoughtful conversation. Uh, thanks to our staff for their support of our meetings. Uh, we're adjourned until our next meeting, March 22nd. Again, thank you all for being here tonight. Good night. Thanks, Fred. Everybody stay thank well. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night.